you're ready to go. I appreciate that. For any of you just joining us, I'm Becky Senf. I work as chief curator here at the Center for Creative Photography. I have a few items of business to go through and a few thank yous. Um, Ann Tucker pointed out to me uh, and wanted our audience to know that Michael Bishop's archive went to VSW and at VSW it is digitized and online so it's accessible and it is available for scholars to investigate and to work with. Um, I want to recap the schedule for the rest of the day. This afternoon we're going to hear from two panels, each of which will include time for audience participation and questions to the panelists. There's going to be a short break in between, so this is one of those, if you need coffee, if you need the bathroom, you can pop out, but we're going to try and stay on schedule, so we appreciate if you don't need to, to stay uh, in the auditorium. We'll offer a slightly longer break at 4.30, and then at 5 o'clock we're going to reconvene here for a screening of the new film about Light Gallery called Light, When Photography Was Undiscovered, 1971 to 1987 which will be followed by a Q&A with the filmmaker Lisa Imardino Vreeland. Following the film, we invite you to come to Atherton Gallery for a reception of the opening of the exhibition Land Reform, featuring the work of Frank Golke, Mark Klett, Michael Berman, and Mike Molno. Uh, I want to remind you that this exhibition comes with an audio guide, and there are slips like this that are on the front desk, looks like this. You maybe have one in your packet, but you definitely can get it at the front desk. Max McCoslin, one of the center's great patrons and donors, provided money for us to have a new audio guide system. It's terrific. You can listen to it in the gallery, but it's also web-based. So when you go home and you're thinking about light and pining for the CCP, you can go online and listen to it, and it becomes a virtual tour of the exhibition away from the center as well. Um, I want to thank the center staff speaking from my role as CCP curator. Um, this show has been unlike any show I've ever worked on, and it has been really fun to think about what an exhibition can be and new ways to think about what an ex exhibition can be. It's also terrifying to do an exhibition that is this different from what I've done before and has so many stakeholders, which you can all appreciate. There are lots of people invested in what an exhibition about light is about and looks like. Um, that this process has really involved the CCP staff in a way that other exhibitions haven't, and I'm deeply grateful to my colleagues here for their creativity, for their willingness, for their flexibility, for their brilliant ideas, uh, and for their team spiritedness. It has really been an incredible experience, and I'm, I'm very grateful. Uh, I want to thank the exhibition lenders, Scott Baker and Marianne Hesseldens, Peter McGill, Bob Mann, Larry Miller, and Rick Wester, who made the show what it is. Um, I also want to mention that you all got something that looks like this, a packet in your uh, bags that includes all of these spreadsheets attached to it. We want to add a component to the exhibition about the context that Light Gallery existed within particularly the commercial galleries and nonprofit galleries that were also happening prior to and um, alongside Light Gallery, uh, the, the educational institutions that provided the artists that supported these galleries and the museum programs. And we know that you all know lots of things that we don't. So we're sharing with you the research that we've done so far and asking for your input if you're willing to share that with us. And so they'll, you'll find this in your bags. You can add to them and hand them back in to us. We will email you a copy if you want. And then there's an online survey where you can put information in digitally if that's easier for you. So all the ways. All right, I also want to thank um, the many interviewees that shared their time and their expertise with us over the process of this exhibition research. Um, it's been a really um, very moving and powerful experience to talk to the people we've talked to. We're continuing in that research process, so if you haven't talked to us yet and want to share your experiences with light, we'd love to talk to you. But so far, we've spoken to Susan Barnett, Tom Barrow, Adam Bartos, Paul Berger, Peter Bennell, Maudie Clay, A.D. Coleman, Linda Connor, Eileen Cowan, Mitch Epstein, Larry Fink, Frank Golke, 
Edith Gowan, Emmett Gowan, Richard Grossbard, Gary Hallman, Susan Harder, Marvin Heiferman, Brian Hotchkiss, Harold Jones, Susan Kesmerick, Mark Klett, Peter McGill, Joe Maloney, Robert Mann, Richard Menchel, Dwayne Michaels, Lawrence Miller, Tim Mossman, B. Nettles, Stephen Perloff, Jill Quasha, Neil Rantoul, Marsha Resnick, Leland Rice, Jack Sal, Fern Shod, Julia Scully, Victor Schrager, Neil Slavin, Jerry Spagnoli, Susan Spiritus, Sally Stein, Charles Traub, Ann Tucker, and Rick Wester. And can we please have a round of applause for those folks? Thank you all. I really appreciate it. I want to say a few words about how this afternoon's panels were conceived, and then we'll launch. Um, as we learned about light and the notion of photographic community surfaced as a primary concern and component, we began to think about how that community has grown and changed and how it currently discusses a whole new range of concerns. It seemed that talking about the photographic community as it is now could be very valuable to us. So we invited uh, artist Alex Soth, whose nearly 200,000 followers on Instagram belong to a kind of virtual community. SPE Executive Director Liz Allen, who represents such a key photographic organization and one that predates Light Gallery. Sarah Stolfa, who's the CEO and Artistic Director of the Philadelphia Photo Arts Center, who not only engages with community, but with the value of meaningfully representing the full diversity of her local community. And Dominique Luster, the Charles Teeny Harris Archivist at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who thinks about how archivists can give voice to underrepresented communities. Our second panel, which will follow this one, uh, relates to valuing story. And in the process of interviewing all those people that you heard me list for this project, I thought a lot about how we tell our own stories and about how they shape not only how we think about ourselves, but then how history actually gets told. So uh, by a show of hands, I'm going to give you a list, and if you fit any of these categories, I would like you to raise your hand. If you listen to podcasts, if you listen to radio shows like This American Life, Moth Radio Hour, or StoryCorps, have ever given an oral history or use oral history in your research? Okay, so everybody look around. It seems like a pretty relevant thing for us to do. So, so that's what we're going to do in the second half of this afternoon. We're going to think about storytelling with Molly Garfinkel of the Place Matters program at City Lore, which calls itself New York City Center for Ur Urban Folk Culture. Matthew Greeley, who's an assistant professor here at the University of Arizona in the psychology department, who investigates how brain, the brain stores and retrieves memories of everyday life. Cassie May, who's the oral history archivist at the Jerome Robbins Dance Division at the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts. And Judy Natal, a photographer who's integrated oral history into her art practice. So, if you will please join me in welcoming Rick Wester and his panelists, Liz Allen, Dominique Lester, Alex Soth, and Sarah Stolfa. I forgot my glasses. Thank you, Becky. So I got an email from someone who's following us on the live stream, and she asked that those of us who are using the microphone, both in the audience and on stage, really speak into the microphone, because if you're too far away, the people listening to the live stream can't hear you at all. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh -huh. And I do know that we have an audience in Europe today, because I've gotten emails from uh, artists and clients of mine from London and from the continent, so we are being paid attention to. It's really nice to, to know that. The concept of community is as multifaceted as there are groups of people to define it. Community differs in size and scope depending upon the perspective of the viewer from the outside, which is the most important aspect to, to, what, to what we will be addressing this afternoon. Having signed up to be here, you probably know that the panel was assigned by Becky to discuss the question of engaging community as the topic came out of her research on light 
and the conversations she had with dozens of artists, former employees, collectors, and other people with the connection to light where community was con uh, consistently named. Light was founded with the central idea that the gallery should be a forum for photographers and those committed to the medium's advancement and recognition of art at a time when serious con consideration to the question, is photography art, barely existed beyond the small numbers of aficiando, uh, aficiandos who already knew the answer. In my conversations with Becky, we have addressed numerous questions about the topic. In short, they loosely resemble a Dickinsonian Christmas tale. Was there a photography community past? Is there a present one? What are the chances of a photography community yet to come? It is not an exaggeration to say that community is central to the most important cultural issue of the day, and that is, of course, the need to diversify our understanding of the breadth of society. To speak of community is to speak of inclusion, and conversely, exclusion. Light was an institution devoted to essentially a modernist history through the importation of the aesthetics of the avant-garde period of between the wars as brought to the United States by Laszlo Maholi Naj and transplanted at the Institute of Design in Chicago. These idioms were partially embraced by two of the most important artists Light represented who both taught at the ID, Harry Callahan and Aaron Siskin. Although Callahan was once famously quoted as saying out of frustration about the ID under Maholi, everything was Bauhaus this and Bauhaus that. In some respects, what Callahan, Siskin, and others did in Chicago was to Americanize the modernist tropes of, European, of the European avant-garde, and by extension, what Harold Jones, Tennyson Schad, and Fern Schad did was to bring new American photographs to New York. Embedded within the artistic and creative choices they made to express Light's purpose were the a priori conditions of the art world then. Light was mostly a white male-driven modernist institution but to reduce it to that is to strip away from it the most important contribution to the medium it made, which was to give hope and a home with deep respect to all photographers who previously had neither for their work. It paved the way for a now decades old market with an international, indeed a global audience. Working at light, one could not help but be entranced by the idea of being part of a community where giants roamed the earth. It was a regular occurrence to go to work and receive prints from Harry Callahan go to a birthday party and dance with Aaron Siskin, lay out an exhibition with Nick Nixon, carefully and respectfully inventory the finest prints of Emmett Gowan, or even give directions to the bathroom in Tennyson's office to Robert Frank. Who would not want to, be, uh, who would not want to belong to such a club? In, on, today's pan, pan, oh, excuse me. on today's panel, we will address the concept of community without the hope of defining it in today's multicultural pan-identity world. Like what Justice Stuart Potter said about pornography, I'll say about community. I know it when I see it. This very accomplished group of panelists, whom I'm extremely honored and humbled to be sharing the stage with, are four individuals whose careers in photography amount to a mountain range of experience, each with its own unique relationship to community. They will be presenting short five-minute representations of their own histories, mostly in pictures, and we will then delve into a conversation about community. We hope to end with about 15 minutes of questions and answers, and I thank you for attending. We're going to begin with Liz Allen. We're going to go alphabetically through the panel. Thank you. I uh, do represent the Society for Photographic Education. Is that okay with the sound? Uh, I'm not the executive director. I'm a volunteer board member and the current chair of SPE. And I wrote everything down. Um, because I just got back from a trip and I'm still a bit jet lagged. This year's members will come together for the 57th annual conference of the Society for Photographic Education in Houston, Texas. And members from California will not get funding from their state institutions to attend because California has taken the bold stand to protest discriminatory laws against LGBTQ people. This postcard promoting the conference features the image of one of our invited speakers, Zachary Drucker, a, media, a multimedia artist, activist, and television producer. This is Zachary and Sabrina from her project, Portraits of Flawless Sabrina. Um, 
This year, SPE is collaborating with PhotoFest and will recognize Fred Baldwin and Wendy Watrous with the SPE Icon of Photography Award, Liz Wells and Mark Seeley, the Director of Autograph in London and the 2020 PhotoFest Curator of African Cosmologies will open the conference on Thursday with a conversation. Understanding how photography matters in the world. The Society for Photographic Education participates in the evolving understanding of the most democratizing language in history, the photographic image. The photograph can be used for self-expression, to empower individuals, and amplify the voices of underserved communities, as well as mis malign, mislead, and manipulate. It is for these reasons that photography education is so vital in the 21st century. As Britt mentioned yesterday, SPE was founded in the early 1960s. The first meeting was organized as a teacher's invitational by Nathan Lyons at a time when photography was facing a crisis of obscurity. Our member-based nonprofit organization is still primarily made up of educators. As Britt mentioned yesterday, the 70s progressed into the 80s and 90s, and photography education blossomed and then exploded. But things have changed. Photography has become so popular and such a part of our daily life that photography now faces a crisis of ubiquity. SPE members' benefits include an online membership gallery and resources that include a vi video library, calls for entry, and teaching resources. SPE's annual conference have addressed issues of social justice, immigration, evolving definitions of family, the Anthropocene and social, environmental, and economic consequences of climate change, and the effects of new technologies on our understanding of human reality. The conferences include presentations by artists and scholars, as well as industry professionals, professional and student portfolio review sessions, and on-site member exhibitions. SPE's publication, Exposure, will celebrate its 50th year in Houston and has transitioned from a print publication to an online resource for articles about pedagogy, artist reviews, and essays. We are republishing articles from the archive leading up to the March conference and have invited writers like A.D. Coleman to update their comments. And he has a recent uh, updated article on the website now. SPE continues to be an organization peopled primarily by fine art photographers, uh, curators, scholars, and historians. SPE's community is made up of chapters that are regional, including an international chapter, and caucuses that include the Multicultural Women's Caucus, LGBTQ, Contingent Faculty, and High School Educators Caucuses. SPE community is increasingly made up of adjunct faculty. Current research by the American Association of the University Professors estimates that teaching in higher education has shifted from a majority tenured faculty to an estimated 70% of instructional staff being non-tenured and contingent. While, this causes, while these caucuses help to address issues of these groups, SPE continues to suffer from the lack of diversity that we see in our university programs and in this room. We are, however, striving to reach beyond the borders of the United States to participate in international forums. We have organized an exhibition of SPE's honored educators at the Pingyao International Photography Festival for three of the last four years, and I was invited to participate in the Educators Forum in 2019. And I returned just last week from a symposium in Delhi that included educators from India, Bangladesh, and Nepal, and was sponsored by SPE and the Murthy Nayak Foundation. My experiences sharing, these educators, sharing with these educators underline the challenges that we face here in the U.S. because of cuts to public education over the last four decades and the shift to contingent faculty, our members, and therefore our organization, face not only financial challenges, but challenges to academic freedom, 
that undermine higher education's role in fostering future leaders and engaged citizens and developing innovations that confront the status quo. It is a gathering together to celebrate and examine our past and ask questions that will point us in the direction of a more equitable society that we will step boldly into the future. This is an image by Xavier Simmons. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. OK. This will go so much better if we all participate. Good afternoon. My name is Dominique Luster. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Um, I have the great privilege and honor to speak with you a little bit about um, kind of the coolest, most dapper gentleman I've ever had the honor and privilege of, of working with, and that is the work of Charles Teeny Harris. So I bring you greetings from Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, um, where it is snowing. So thank you for letting me be here. But l why don't we just kind of breeze through a little bit of photography about, uh, about Teeny and about the archive. I represent an archive of just the artist's work. It's a very special privilege to be in, where we are a photography collection of about 80,000 large format 4x5 photographic negatives. Um, which is a considerable amount for a photographer who's primarily going to be working from the 1930s to the 1970s. So what's really interesting about my position in this work today is that the work that, the photography that I'm working with, the photojournalist that I'm working with is a little earlier than the work um, that we've been talking about for the rest of the symposium. So I'm really interested in learning um, how and where these two worlds intercede. And so this is uh, just a little bit about what the collection um, says on paper, what it looks like on paper, but what I'm really interested in talking to you about today is the community that this photography archive represents. Can everyone hear me okay? I have one of those really big theater voices, so um, I'm going to temper the mic a little uh, appropriately. Yes, please, make sure you can see. So let me tell you about the greatest community I've ever worked with. First of all, in this great collection, there are about 80,000 photographs, as I mentioned, and they're broken up into a few important sections or categories. Um, and I wanted to just highlight a few. And the first category that I'm going to highlight are the studio portraits. Now, what's really exciting about the studio portraits is that there are, I don't know, maybe 10,000 of them. And they're all going to range in a very small amount of time in which Teeny was working in a studio in the hill. And they all have this beautiful kind of halo background. And they range from sweet 16 parties to everyday portraits to military portraits, which is the largest subsection of the collection. There are about 5,000 unidentified military portraits in this collection. Did I mention that the entire collection arrived completely unidentified? Because if I didn't, I should point that out. And I say that to mean that as all of the photographs that we'll look at today are mostly unidentified individuals. And we'll talk about why that's important. But we have the studio portraits, right? So we're here, we have studio portraits. We have portraits of children. Teeny Harris loved children. I mean, look at them. Um, well, and obviously he loved children. He had five of them. So I could see why um, he had this unique ability to work within his community uh, in Pittsburgh. And he could walk into someone's house and gather up all the kids. And if you've ever tried to wrangle kids for a photograph, you, you can understand what a challenge that was. And he comes in, he gets his one photograph, you get something gorgeous like this, and then he's out. Um, that's kind of why he has the nickname that you may have heard of called One Shot Harris. Um, <laughs> So it's quite remarkable. And he is very much known for photographing families. Um, he's a family man. He's a member of the family community. This is actually a photograph of my coworker, Charlene. And if, had I remembered that this event was going to be live streamed, I wouldn't have included it because she doesn't know that I use it. <laughs> this. <laughs> I mean, look at her, she's amazing. So this is a photograph of my colleague and just, again, these probably tied for teeny most incredible woman I've ever met, or incredible person I've ever met in my entire life. Um, it's what's wonderful about working with the collection is that she's in it. And so while we have 80,000 unidentified photographs, 
and that includes about 300,000 unidentified individuals, we have this magical human who by eye, because she was there, because she grew up in the community, because she's from the Hill District, Hill District, because her father is a civil rights leader, she can go through the photographs and say, this is this person, this is that person. And speaking of, um, we have the next largest section of photographs in the collection are our wedding portraits. And what's really exciting about our wedding portraits is that the, the, the largest, I would say, reference resource question that we get is where are my parents' wedding photos? So we get to go through those. I'm gonna blitz through this really quickly. There's sports photography. If you're ever interested in the Negro Leagues, every, we, who's this guy? Okay, good. I wasn't, I wasn't sure where we were going. I, there's usually a gasp when I show this photograph and I didn't get it. There's the entertainers, Lena Horne. All right, let's just keep going. We're going for it. Now, I bet you won't guess who's in this photograph. Oh, Honey Boy Miner, anybody? Leroy Brown, Errol Garner. Now, this is all in Pittsburgh in the 1940s. It's quite incredible. Let's keep going. Anybody has ever heard of the beautiful celebration of African American parades? I mean, it's a spectacle unlike anything you've ever seen. This guy? Okay, good. <laughs> What's interesting and just something I'd like to point out at this photograph is if you're, if you're familiar with the uh, work of photojournalists, you would, I can tell you that Teeny's working on a large format speed graphic in the, that he's had since the 40s or 50s. How close is he? He's incredibly close. Private social clubs, the social networks and the fabric of African American life is extremely documented. Nightlife, the jazz clubs, the rise of the jazz era. But also this collection is one of the most beautiful textures of discrimination in the country as well as all of the highlights and love lives. And that also includes um, more difficult photography as well, but as a photojournalist and as an African-American man of his community, it's his, it's his duty and it's my duty um, to continue those photographs forward. Um, last, last test. Okay, just making sure that we're all still here. Um, so as I just wanted to kind of briefly introduce you to the world that I get to work in every day and we'll talk further about what this community looks like on the panel, but um, well, that didn't come out as well as it looks, but um, just as a concluding thought, um, the Teeny Harris Archive, we're really excited to be a part of our community. We work within the community. Because the photographs were unidentified, we work with all of the photographs that you saw today as well as the 80,000 others, and we work in senior citizens' communities. We work in YMCA's, Boys and Girls Clubs, YWCA's. We are a member and a staple because we want to be able to sit on someone's porch and say, will you tell me what happened? Um, we try to restore name and voice to the photographs. Uh, and that's kind of what I get to do every day. So I'm really interested to hear what you do every day. All right. Thank you. Wow, super tough back to follow. I, uh, I once spoke at a, at a grade school, and it was like a career day. And the first speaker was Alan Page, who was the, the greatest Minnesota Viking of all time, who then went on to become a Supreme Court judge in Minnesota, and I followed him. <laughs> uh, so this is sort of like that, with Teeny Harris, who's so amazing and such a community photographer. And, and, and then there's me. And so <laughs> so I, when, Becky, when Becky wrote me, I, I uh, I thought, well, I'm not, you know, I wasn't part of Light Gallery, and I'm, you know, I'm, community is not the word that comes to mind. With, you know, I think like existential loneliness, you know, that panel. Um, <laughs> I think I have a, yeah. So this is a, uh, and that's always been my subject in some ways. Uh, so this is pre-internet age dating. Um, so that's a that's a personal ad on a billboard. And I've always been attracted to loneliness and longing for connection, I guess. Um, and this eventually led to this project, Sleeping by the Mississippi, in which uh, you know, I traveled the length of the river. And, 
And it's very much in the spirit of, you know, Huckleberry Finn and this individualistic wanderlust and so forth. Um, and the attraction of photography to me was this ability to work alone, that it suited my sensibility, I guess. Um, but the more I did it, and then once I, especially once I started to have a career, I, I did crave community. And I had to figure out how to go about that. And fortunately, the internet developed at the same time as my career. And so then you had these things called blogs. And for, for a guy like me, that was like a safe way to engage with community. So this is, this is a, you don't, don't read this. This is a blog post from 2006. And, and it's really, it was interesting to look back at this. I, I chose this post about Roger Merton, who was a light gallery artist, I believe, correct? Yep. And, um, and who is, I think, you know, really un underappreciated. Um, but if you notice down here, there were 45 comments to that post. And they weren't they're just like, thumbs up. There were actual paragraphs of dialogue. And so it, it was a kind of community. Uh, but I also, I needed a, a physical community as well. Was, I didn't have a master's degree and I didn't have that community. Uh, of, of going to, to school in that way. Um, and so I, I suddenly had this professional career and one thing led to another and I applied to Magnum and I entered that community. Um, <laughs> last night I searched for an image and th this I think represents my role in Magnum. <laughs> um, sort of, we have, these, we have these business meetings and then actually, especially when I was younger, I got to sit in back and nap while we dis discuss the business. And we, we could talk more about that later because I think it does represent an interesting photographic community. Um, what do I have next here? All right. And then after years of working, doing different projects, I did a project on men who run away from society. I, I was like, enough with the loneliness. And, and I really wanted to engage with community. And I had once had a job as a suburban newspaper photographer. And, and I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to work like that, to work like a Teeny Harris or, or uh, it, where I lived, there was a guy uh, who was a suburban newspaper photographer in Bloomington, Minnesota, who my partner here, uh, Brad Zeller, who's a writer, discovered. And what if we created our own newspaper Brad's the writer, I'm the photographer, and we go out and we photograph community events and so forth. And, and so we started this thing called the Little Brown Mushroom Dispatch, and we did seven issues around the country, and we worked in conjunction with different institutions. So this, this group down here is from, uh, uh, from Cranbrook, and for, for the Michigan issue, we traveled with two of the students to the other students, printed the exhibition, and this was actual real life community engagement. The thing is, my pictures often still looked like this. Uh, so, but this is an, you know, we went to a veterans event and I made the loneliest picture I could possibly make. Uh, because that's, I'm always, uh, I'm always battling with the desire for community and the desire to escape it, which I don't think I'm un unique with in photography. Um, I just have one last story that I want to tell, and, it, and I think it's an important one. So this is uh, Nancy Rexroth. So Nancy Rexroth was a light gallery artist, and uh, I photographed Nancy a couple of years ago, and I'd always, uh, I'd always felt a connection to her work and to her, uh, to what I sensed was her role in the photographic world at large, which is, and when I think about that incredible map, I, I, I think of the, these, these people that are way out here on the limb, kind of alone. But she was, t you know, she was tied to Light Gallery, but uh, she kind of lost touch with community over the years. And, and I, you know, I felt very close to her. And in preparation for, for this event, I, I had about an hour long talk with Nancy, and it, she said one of the most remarkable things. Uh, she's recently, you know, she's going through 
a rediscovery period as are so many, you know, underrepresented people from that time period. And, and she said that her archive was recently acquired by the Cincinnati Art Museum. It was a big moment for her. And she said, you know, I would, I'll give away all my pictures just for a few friends, you know. And, and she also told me that she's, because of that acquisition, people have reached out to her. And within Cincinnati, they've developed a small women's uh, fine art photography group. And it's, it was really a, a, a positive message, I think. So thank you. Hi. You guys still awake? Um, hi, my name is Sarah Stolfa, and I'm the founding uh, artistic director of the Philadelphia Photo Arts Center. Um, we call ourselves PPAC for short, and in actuality, I'm an artist that 10 years ago opened a nonprofit art center um, because there was a need for resources for contemporary artists working in Philadelphia that was, became, was not there. And so um, 10 years later, um, here we still are, and about a few years into our um, into our founding, um, we were a very small organization. Um, at our smallest point, it was me and a part-time person. But as we started to grow, we started to really, oh, well, I can say I started to really think about who we were as an organization and what was going to be our impact on the city and what was going to be our impact on our community. And so we are in a neighborhood called South Kensington. It's an old industrial neighborhood in Philadelphia that was completely vacated when industry left uh, urban cities. It went through a period of severe blight, um, whereas huge amounts of vacant lots, um, though there was many long-term residents still there. And as what happens in so many uh, neighborhoods, especially um, in cities, and Philadelphia is not exempt, is that artists and arts institutions start to go into neighborhoods that had experienced blight, and then the neighborhoods start to change. And so realizing that we were part of this process and part of an art community that honestly, as an organization, and who we served and who was involved and who was our board, we were a white organization, just like other the historical narrative of many arts institutions that are historically um, for people with economic means and with white skin. And so realizing and looking out into our neighborhood and realizing that we were part of what was happening to this neighborhood, we decided to, to change the narrative and change who we were gonna talk to and how we were gonna work with the community and really what does that mean community? Because at PPAC, we understand and believe that it's our role as an arts organization to reach people where they are in terms of their um, creativity and desire to be creative. It's not enough just to be free and open. You have to meet people where they are. And so this project we developed called the Philly Block Project was a direct response about our changing neighborhood and what was our role and conversation in it. So we invited Hank Willis Thomas, because he has roots in Philadelphia, to come and create a project. And the Philly Block Project was born. And here you'll see the um, final exhibition where Hank and a group of photographers, because Hank really doesn't work alone, and that was one of the reasons why we asked him to come, because we really wanted a collaborative uh, project, not only with artists, but also with community members and um, really our own local artist. And so Hank came and um, they photographed the neighborhood because our neighborhood was right at the beginning of this dramatic shift. Um, the neighborhood looks nothing like it does at this time, at this point. Um, and so we created an exhibition that recreated the block that we photographed that was kind of our middle point for the neighborhood and recreated it in, in our gallery walls. And all of a sudden, people from the neighborhood finally came to PPAC. That never happened before this project. So here's an installation shot uh, leading into our space. We photograph community members in front of their homes around our neighborhood. Um, so here you'll see a picture of community members looking at their neighbors. Not only did we have this floor to ceiling images of people outside their homes, um, Hank also designed um, these walls that are kind of like these brick walls that reference a lot of the housing in Philadelphia where there's just thousands of pictures from the community. 
We also did um, oral history taking. And part of this project would also include a community archive where we asked residents to submit photographs of what they believe their neighborhood was. Because uh, if you look up South Kensington, you look up photographs in the city archives, you'll see when it was an industrial, you know, in its height of industry. But after that point, there's no more photographic record. So we asked the community to create a photographic record where the uh, curator, Kalia Brooks, then made an exhibition of their photographs. Um, land is a big issue in our neighborhood and saving green space um, in the, in the, in the, at this moment when development is rampant in our neighborhood. So we created a community pop-up park called The Meadows where we put photographs from the archive as well as uh, Hank's pictures on banners, sorry, flags in the meadow. Um, and then you can see it says Wednesday night in the meadows. We then did free programming every Wednesday and we only sourced talent from our neighborhood. So filmmakers who made documentaries, um, performing artists, we had um, this really amazing celebration of what our community was at that point in history because we knew it was gonna change. That's why at Gallery, one of uh, Hank's collaborators on the project. I'm getting used to this clicker. It's way slower than I am. And to, to end the project, to make sure that the whole neighborhood did come to um, see the exhibition, we closed down our street. We're in a really old, big industrial building, um, which is this really big street at one point that had railroad tracks from old industry in it. And we had an arts carnival where we asked uh, local artists to have art making activities, as well as we brought in big carnival rides. And we had a community organizer on the project, and he went around to every single house in our neighborhood and gave away free tickets for all the rides to make sure that our neighbors didn't have to pay for any rides. When they showed up and didn't have tickets, they, all they had to do was walk through the gallery, our way of getting them to see the show, to get tickets. It was really amazing. But I promised my staff we would never do it again. Like a pop-up park and a carnival? Like, it's not really what you would think an organization that's photography-based would do. But you really got to think outside of the box. Not everything that you do is going to appeal to all communities. So you re really need to think about the community you want to engage with and have a conversation about what that looks like with them. Um, this was uh, for one of the openings. We um, hired the local um, drum, uh, drum band, and we had a parade through the neighborhood. Again, you'll see the banners uh, on PPAC, that's sourced from the archive itself from the neighborhood. So those are residents um, submitting photographs. Our next big project that we uh, actually isn't done, but we finished it up at, in Philadelphia, and now we're taking it on the road, is the Women's Mulvey Museum. We invited um, South African artist and activist uh, Zanelli Moholi to come and do a residency. Their response was that they didn't need that type of resource. So the only way that they would come was if we created um, an internship for 10 Philadelphia women who had never been able to engage in an arts education, predominantly because of economic, cultural, and, uh, cultural and societal issues, or barriers, sorry. And so we had a paid internship for 10 women. Um, we had over 60 apply for the application. They had a studio in the building. They learned photography. We had a psychologist on the project because we understood that the, the population we were pulling from were um, victims of trauma and, and continued trauma and would experience trauma just going through this type of um, re opportunity where they could um, reconsider themselves as artists um, that would have exhibitions and publications. Um, Moholi came to um, Philadelphia and worked with all the artists for six weeks. They then created, um, we created, all of us, uh, community exhibitions, because uh, the project was really about who is art for, um, who takes pictures, who's the subject of art, uh, where is art represented? Who is allowed into that space? And so we created community exhibitions that went into neighborhoods that didn't have art spaces within them to do programming and to um, have a conversation about uh, the exhibition itself. 
So when I say the product's not done, um, I'm excited to say that we're traveling. The, um, so that we had the two community organizations, two community exhibitions. We then had that exhibition go into the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, because if we're talking about art institutions and who's involved and who's shown and who's represented, we really wanted an a, a institutional partner. Then we had a final exhibition at PPAC. The community exhibition is now tra traveling to Iowa, DC, New Orleans, and uh, Johannesburg. And I'm excited to say that the women who participated in the project will be going to Johannesburg for two weeks to work with Maholi and her community there. Uh, this last project we just closed up was by, by uh, Rashad Newsom. It's a project that was called Black Magic. Uh, what you see here is the installation shot um, for the exhibition, what, which was called To Be Real. Uh, that's Jasmine Wahi, who was a curator on the project. Um, I don't know how many people know about Rashad's work, um, but his work um, spans uh, really um, exploring identity, sexuality, uh, representation, uh, colonialism, and how um, work by uh, artists of color is co-opted into um, the white main, uh, mainstream society. So one thing that he has explored a lot and has uh, dove into is the Vogue community. The Vogue community um, uh, stems from New York, from uh, black and Latinx uh, population, um, where the houses and balls come from. Um, it's a community that really has built their own community because a lot of times um, members of this community are shunned by the regular community or their family community. So they really built their own community of, for themselves. Um, so this is the uh, Champion Art Ball, uh, which is a big um, Vogue competition and celebration of all uh, type of art, um, even art that you don't see in the, in the walls of a white gallery um, or cube. Uh, so fashion, music, um, Vogue dancing. And this brought in a very different community that would normally come to PPAC. So we really collaborate with the artists to reach out to the communities that they want to, to work with, as well as other community organizations within the city to help um, spread the word. Um, so those are uh, exhibition projects that really uh, work in different communities. Um, uh, one of our core programs is uh, Teen Photo, which is an after school program for uh, Philadelphia high school students that are in public school. So it's a free program that runs the entire school year. We serve 70 students a year. Uh, they get a camera for the whole time and they learn photography and end with an exhibition. Um, for, the ex for the exhibition and the opening, they get to decide what they want to do for the opening reception. A lot of times, these, um, these students are so amazing. They're really dedicated and really talented, um, and many of them are multidisciplinary. So here we have one of our um, students um, singing and performing a song that they wrote. Another core program um, is the Photo in Schools program, where we send teaching artists into the community for 10-week residencies at middle and elementary schools. I feel like I'm over time. So um, <laughs> um, this is another exhibition um, by, by Colette Fu, where she built in our gallery the largest pop-up book. Um, what was really wonderful about this is that it brought in an intergenerational audience. Um, out of uh, the Philly Block Project, one of our community members was like, you should have a women's group, photography gr group, and call it Oh Snap. And we're like, okay. So <laughs> four years later, we're still having it. So once a month they meet, they do workshops that we bring in visiting artists, but it's a um, women-identified group um, that has be become a real community support for each other. And then finally, we actively participate in art festivals um, so that we can really do hands-on art making because at the core of who we believe uh, what we are is that our responsibility, um, our belief is that everyone is creative and it's our responsibility as an art institution to blur the boundaries between arts institutions, artists, and the resources to make it. So we really want to um, blur those boundaries and as an organization, we've been able to do that thus far. Thank you. Wow. Um, 
Anybody care to define community from all of that? Um, <laughs> so I think that one of the, um, I'm gonna extrapolate a little bit here because you know, we're all brought together under this umbrella of discussing uh, light galleries uh, influence on, on photography. And um, rather than sort of address the first question that I had, which was about, you know, what in the past uh, did you feel um, uh, a community, you know, what, what community in the past did you really feel a part of, you know, as a uh, maybe an outgrowth of what uh, uh, the photography market brought to the world? Um, I think we've kind of answered that. You, you've all had these amazing experiences uh, where photography has basically been the avenue in which to reach out to humanity. Um, and I, I'm really very curious about, and we talked about this a little bit on email, that I'm very curious about like, what questions you have for each other in terms of um, um, how uh, your experience uh, within the communities that you've described um, have uh, um, uh, Further developed, you know, your careers and your your placement in in the uh, uh, in, in 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 the institutions that you're involved with. Um, one thing that I do find interesting right now is that this is the tenth anniversary of Instagram, um, which is uh, you know maybe this becomes the decade of uh, uh, post Instagram era. Um, but I think I want to th uh, start this off by throwing it back to you, Alec, in terms of how um, social media has played into it, because I think that's something that all of us can, can sort of relate to and, and contribute to. Um, as I understand it, your, you know, your blog er was fairly early on. How did that set you up for, I mean, what, you have 200,000 followers on Instagram, something like that? Y yeah, but... Uh so sorry to start off on a skeptical note, but uh, to, I, there's a big number, but uh, you know, I wouldn't call you know, Kardashian audience a community on Instagram. Uh, so it's not about, it's not about numbers. And, and I really thought that, the, that blogs had a community. Um, and I think that there's, and Flickr had a community. And, uh, but as it's developed, this Instagram age, um, something has happened, I think. And, it, and this to me, as I've been thinking about this for the last few weeks, and this is kind of my question for the group, is that I, I've wondered if there's something that's, that happens uh, because of economics or, or what have you that almost mirrors what happens uh, in the culture at large where you have these wealthy organizations, so you have MoMA or whatever it is, it's big, big and powerful, um, and you have little scrappy independent groups, people that pull things together, but it's these mid-sized groups that, that feel the strain, that they either have to gr try to grow to be a, a dominant force or they fall apart. Because this is what happened uh, to those groups that really helped me in Minnesota. They, they went by the wayside. Right. And, and I almost see that in social media, where it's now this corporation of Instagram has taken over that mid-level community feeling of blogs. Right. Uh, I, get, uh, I guess I could say um, we're in that transition. Like, we're still a little scrappy. We're still a little, um, you know, we're getting our governance and issue, and we're becoming more professional and we're growing, and but um, we are feeling the strain of um, of that growth. Um, and when you have programs like Teen Photo that have been around for ten years, and we don't recruit for the program, the students are our recruiters. Um, you feel really obligated to to continue with those type of programs, and we love the, that program, but it is a struggle to to continue. I can one say one thing about the Instagram thing is that we've really realized as an organization that um, our, our impact is on a, in terms of actual people, like an individual person and having a really in authentic engagement that's not a quick 
flash by is something we can only do locally, you know? And so even with the Women's Mobile Museum, with those artists, when the project was done, we were all like, oh, now what? And you can't get more funding for it because it's, that's not how it works. But um, we've developed ways to keep, continue working with those artists. Um, but for us, it's the hyper-local hyper in terms of impact, in terms of person. I think our exhibitions are starting to get recognition passed, and that's really great for PPAC, because um, I don't have to beg artists to work with us as much anymore. But um, our real impact is on the local. Right. And uh, Dominique, um, you, you've essentially, uh, you've digitized a lot of the archive at this point, right? Um, I think I read 60,000 images or something like that? Okay. And um, so uh, your desire to identify the sitters in Teeny's pictures, um, I would imagine that social media plays a big role in that? Interestingly enough, no. <laughs> Which is not the answer that I thought you were, that I think you were leaning for. Um, so what's interesting with the Teeny Harris collection, well, first off, to the Instagram comment, I do like to feel as if Teeny invented the selfie in like 1934. <laughs> um, so we have these like really gorgeous but like broody like s experiments with like portraiture very early on and it's like a very early instant of what might Instagram may have looked like <laughs> in 1935. It's very cool. But uh, because the collection, because of the date range of the collection, the majority of the audience or the community that I work with um, were maybe in their 20s or 30s in the 30s and 40s or mm -hmm. 50s. And so the majority of my community, A, um, are of a certain age. Um, so they're not naturally on Instagram or things like that. And then two, uh, my community at lives at or below the digital divide and the majority of the folks that I work with may have access to internet just on a mobile device, may not have it at home. Um, and so their mobile connectivity to the world is, if they have it, it may m mostly be through Facebook or things like that, connecting with high school friends. Um, but identification doesn't, crowdsourcing of identification on social media just hasn't proven to be successful um, because it's more of a people to people. People like to find people, um, if they like to do our oral history program where we, they come into our office um, we sit down with a stack of photographs. Uh, we know that, say, you graduated from Shenley High School in 1955. We start off with all the photographs of Shenley High School in 1955. We ask you, well, where did you go to church? Well, where did you get married? Or where you were on the swim team? Let me pull all of the photos for the swim team. So it's a very, I guess, analog process. And that has been far more successful for us than any sort of um, digital crowdsourcing. It's been very, it's, it's very interesting because it's the opposite of what you might expect in 2019, 2020. Well, it makes sense, I think, because of the generational gap yeah. in terms of the uh, rise of social media and, and who's in the pictures. Um, so, Liz, I would imagine that SPEs probably um, benefited pretty greatly from the uh, rise of social media. Is that the case? Um, I would say not really. I mean, I think. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> that you two, two for four, batting 500 <laughs> today. Thank yeah. Um, we do have an Instagram account. Uh, our caucuses have been active on that and taking over Instagram and things like that. Um, but it's not, still not where most of our members uh, engage necessarily. And uh, I think it's just part of a shift that we're kind of behind the curve still. Right. Um, I also implied in my presentation the challenge, the financial challenges that SPE as well as faculty has um, been experienced. And so we've, we've stayed at this mid-level size organization even though we're all across the country. Uh, we've definitely had discussions about, um, you know, getting to a million dollar a year operations budget and um, we're not there. Uh, and, uh, we, we, you know, our, as I said, contingent faculty is increasing in numbers across the United States. And I'm not just talking about art education, higher education. This is across the board. Um, that research from AAUP was talking about all universities, all programs, increasing to 70% right. contingent faculty. So that affects 
uh, people's ability to participate in things like SPE and come to our conferences and gatherings like this, right? Um, that's, that's, there's a restrictive hurdle there uh, that we all experience in relation to funding. Well, um, I'm actually somewhat relieved that um, my batting average went down. Um, <laughs> um, basically because uh, in, uh, for those of you that know me as a gallerist, I, I've, I've uh, uh, complained about the role of social media, the internet and social media in, in our little corner of, of the art world. Uh, basically because I had developed this cliche that what social media has done, or what the internet has done to the art market was basically to replace uh, experience with information so that if people had the information, they believed that they had the experience. And what it sounds like to me is that, especially with the two of you, where you're really hands-on, person-to-person, that um, they have to have the experience in order to uh, contribute uh, to the community. Um, what I'm actually encouraged by is that over the last couple of years, I've noticed is that people are getting the information and now they want the experience. And I believe that that is sort of the, the trend in, in uh, I'm sure you're gonna see this in the second 10 years of Instagram uh, with the corporations that can afford to uh, manipulate the, the media in such a way that you're gonna be getting a lot more experiential um, information uh, on Instagram and other other online sources, especially with the advent of, of um, uh, 5G, uh, where you know streaming and, and uh, massive images will be a lot easier to to transmit. Uh, so I, I I'm actually kind of encouraged that that you guys are still doing it the old-fashioned way. You know, um, did you have something to say, Arthur? Uh, no, I mean the one thing I I, I would add is that social media really helps these physical activities happen. So that um, in thinking about, because I wanted to come in here and say like, photography community's dead, or you know. <laughs> but I started looking around and I'm like, well there's eight million uh, Facebook the groups, let's go out and do street shooting together, or let's, you know, these little micro groups. And they get together via social media. And, right. and, and, that, and I've seen that with Instagram followers coming to book events, for example. So having a physical, tactile experience. Right, right. Uh, and mm. We're good. Yeah. Uh, and in the case of SPE, uh, we have a spring conference and the feedback that we get about the conference is all about community people's experience about being together and sharing and being able to have conversations and see your friends year after year. I mean, we have a number of um, former board members and current members of SPE in the audience here, some of whom participated in the exhibitions that I helped organize for Ping Yao. And then we also have these chapter conferences. And I just got back from India. I flew all the way to India to meet with people in person. They did not want to Skype or Zoom or, you know, we could have done that. Right. I could have been a big head, you know, on the, on the screen. Um, but the experience that you have when you meet one-on-one -on -one with people and talk about your culture and um, things that are important to you and your experience as a teacher and your experience as an image maker, those things happen best in the same room together despite Instagram. Right, <laughs> right. Um, I think it's uh, really interesting to see how, uh, we, we've come here to, to talk about a photography community. And um, what I absorbed from what each of you had to say about your own experience and the role that photography plays in your experience is that there isn't so much a, um, a photography community as there are communities which have fully grasped photography in a way that, like, when I was growing up and when I cut my teeth at Light Gallery, um, um, it, it, it was very difficult to get people to even consider photography as a form of communication on, on such a massive scale. I mean, certainly Instagram and Facebook would have been unthinkable back then. Um, um, 
And so uh, I wanted, uh, Dominique, I wanted to get back to, um, made a note here from one of the videos that are on your website. Um, by the way, if, if, if you all have a chance, you should um, really, uh, unfortunately, Google each one of these, because I don't think we, we have their websites uh, uh, written down anywhere. But is it dominiquebluster.com? Right. Um, and there are a number of links on Domin Dominique's website to uh, videos and um, um, like YouTube videos and things uh, about Teeny Harris. And uh, the SPE website, of course, is, is like chock full of information. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's actually become a great resource to expand uh, the knowledge of, of community here. Um, I was looking for this quote. There was this beautiful quote that you had. I'm brimming with anticipation of yeah, what I, I know. possibly have said. Me too. I just can't read I don't know if you, I'm sure it was I just can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, so at one point, you, you, you had said that, uh, as an archivist, you said archives have the power to boost marginalized voices, uh, cultural identity, and history. Um, and that history is a series of highly, uh, of, of strategically curated decisions, right? So um, in, in terms of being an archivist, you are sort of like the mayor of this community in, in some <laughs> respects, you know? <laughs> I love it, okay. <laughs> uh, That's so cool. Please, you know, <laughs> feel free to correct me. Um, but I, I wonder how um, uh, you know, being, the, all right, not the mayor, the overseer, the care uh, um, uh, um, I'm gonna go with mayor. Okay, so the... <laughs> mayoress or something? Yeah, the mayoress of, of the community. Um, um, how do you leverage all of that information, all of those images, into expanding your community? Okay. Are you, are you asking how do archivists use collections, photographic collections in my case, to expand the community that the photographs take place within? Um, do, you use the, do you use the archive to reach out to a greater community other than just what you think the community is, is uh, defining? Interesting. I. Um, I did not think so until very recently because it's not my, um, it's not my intention, I would say. Um, so my job is to be the champion of Teeny Harris at every table and in every room. So my job is to be his greatest champion and his greatest advocate because he can't speak for himself any longer. He passed in 1998. So my role is to um, really just be his voice in the world where his work is now becoming um, more widespread than he ever thought imaginable. Um, so there's this great quote from Teeny when we did a retrospective of his work in 2011 that said, I had no idea. So he was you know, a, a poor black photographer from the Hill working for the Pittsburgh Courier. Um, and he never really saw himself as the incredibly brilliant artist that he was, he just worked. Right? Like he just spent 45 years working. And he photographed a community that is as diverse and brilliant and beautiful and fabricated as anyone that I've ever seen. And so now my work is to be the steward of that community. Um, so my job isn't really to do anything more than what the community tells me that it wants. Um, and outside of that, we just simply don't do it. Um, so we're very targeted on stewarding, uplifting, supporting, encouraging, whatever the community says that it wants to do with its own history in the words and, and mannerisms that it wants to do it. And we use the photographs as the connection points because the community are in them. Right. Now, what has happened in maybe the past five years since I've been working, four or five years that I've been working with the collection is that it has expanded from individual to icon, so not intentionally, if you find identi identity or community or relation with the Teeny Harris photograph in Boston, in Chicago, in Detroit, in Atlanta, um, that wasn't necessarily our intention, but it does demonstrate the, um, 
both the nuanced complexity and shared commonality necessarily of, of the African American experience and the American experience that was replicated anywhere. So you could say, you know, these photographs may have taken place in Pittsburgh and my family grew up in Harlem, but we have a shared sense and so it has grown outside of its original community just by um, common fabric and, and shared identity and community and memory building uh, of, this, um, of this larger storytelling pattern that no one saw coming, but everyone got included into. What I was thinking when you were talking about that was um, you see the effects of uh, seeing those images and seeing them preserved and valued on the community that it pictures but it does convey to other black communities that see themselves also in those images and it has such an impo um, positive impact. It does. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's, it's incredible that no matter where you are, anyone and everyone seems to find this, this sense of inclusion in the Teeny Harris collection that I've never really seen in the other collection. Um, regardless of, of race or class or background or socioeconomic, everyone seems to find a sense of place in the Teeny Harris collection, and I think that's what makes the collection and he as an artist so special. Well, we saw that in Sarah's project, too. I mean, you can see that in the people's faces when they look at, each, at the images of the, themselves and their neighborhood and feel you know, the empowerment in that moment of recognizing that someone values picturing us in our lives and what we do and how we look. Yeah, I mean, we definitely saw that in the Philly Block Project with the community archive, and it was, um, it was really um, quite wonderful, especially when we started, because the exhibition wasn't replicas. It wasn't the photographs themselves that were part of the archive. We scanned and took, uh, you know, historical documentation, document, documentation over it, and then Kalia um, curated it and, especially in terms of sizing, right? Or then when we had the banners outside and for you know, community members where it was her father who had passed who was on a banner or for um, a young mother whose daughter had passed at a very young age and her picture was on a flag outside, it was really um, empowering for them to do that. And we also see it really, we're, I can't remember, sorry, yesterday was like a, 20 hour day because of the flight from Philadelphia. So I can't remember if it was yesterday or today, but people are talking about um, the importance of, um, I call it visual literacy, which is really important in today's society with photography being so um, omnipresent. And so in our teen photo program, you know, we're not trying to necessarily pump out 70 photographers a year, um, but one thing that's really important is that they have community, they become a community themselves. Um, but then also they're talking about their communities in the way that they want to talk about it um, and they're understanding, they're understanding, they're learning visual literacy so they know what they're being delivered from the media and other sources and they also know how to deliver something back if they want to say something different, which is really important for um, the youth that we're working with um, because they are so active in Instagram and social media. It gives them a sense of agency. Yeah, I mean, and the other thing that's really awesome is this is the population that um, um, experiences photographs on their phones. So it's really important to us that they print their photographs and they have an exhibition at the end and we do a publication because that, um, I mean, you saw in the one picture that one student talking to a crowd. <laughs> I mean, it's our biggest exhibition in the opening of the year to a crowd very confidently speaking about his work that's hanging on a wall, which is an experience they've never had before. So the printed picture is still really important to us. Um, I think we're going to start running out of time, and, and I thought I would just open the uh, Q&A section up to the audience. Um, and do, we, do we have uh, microphones for? Hi. Dominique? Yes, ma'am. Did you know Teeny? I did not, unfortunately. Did you? No. Oh. I wish I had. Sometimes no. I feel like I do. I get accused of talking to him sometimes and talking <laughs> about him as if I just left him. It, I've heard this. <laughs> and for somebody who's made a, a, a lot of photographs in my life, as many, many people here, 
Um, how how did you come to be hired to do this? Is it is there um, an organization? Is there a museum? Is there uh, who has the collection? How how did you get to have this absolutely fabulous job? It is kind of the greatest job. I'm sorry for everyone else's job in the audience. My job is cooler. <laughs> um, so the collection is uh, housed at the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh. It was acquired in 2001 um, as a complete uh, life's work from the family. Um, Teeny, that's where Teeny wanted it to go. That's where it went. Anne. Um, Anne Chalkoff from the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. Um, I'm thinking about um, SPE and Nathan's reason for founding it and creating this community. And I'm thinking about these teen, teaching teens to photograph. Um, I'm very involved with the Bronx Documentary Center in, in the Bronx, which has a teenage photo league and also with Houston Literacy Through Photography at PhotoFest and Houston Center of Photography's teen group at, at HCP. Speaking of community, I'm just wondering if an organization, a national organization, of all of you who are teaching teens, um, photography for social reasons isn't a viable connection in some way for all of you to, to be able to have a list of all these people who are doing what you're doing and talk to them in some way, whether it's an actual get-together meeting or, you know, just a website, you know, closed website kind of situation where you could say to these other people who are doing the same thing, um, you know, what what, 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 what have you run into? Or I just ran into this and I've never dealt with it before. And, you know, um, the, the same thing that you do with SBE or, or, you know, we do with Oracle or other community groups that have been formed for this. It just seems to me that um, there, there are, I mean, I'm on a funding group that, by the way, uh, <laughs> that helps these specific organizations. So I'm just thinking that there might be a reason for all of you all to get together in some way to, um, you know, to, to, to benefit from your mutual experiences. And then the other question I have, because I'm also working with the Memphis Brooks Museum, and they have the Ernst Weathers archive. Have you all talked at all? You know? Not, not in depth, no. Because I think you know, I'm working with Brooks now on their photography program, and I really think there's there's like another conversation um, that could be useful because so much of Withers is a little bit older, so they have done some work with the community, but I really think that's another dialogue that might be very useful, um, certainly to them. Yes, thank you. I just um, got involved with an organization in Phoenix called Kids in Focus, which is about visual literacy and giving kids who are in foster care or um, experiencing homeless a sense of agency and worth through photography. So the intention is you know, not to make them photographic artists, but just use the tool of photography to give um, a sense of empowerment. Yeah. yeah I think uh, the only comment I would make on that is that um, it's all about this idea of community. So, th you know, how do you expand it? Uh, and I think that that's what I was getting at with you, Dominique, is like, how do you expand um, uh, the communities that you're working within to connect with others? So, um, uh, of course, I'm going to take someone like Anne to, th to think about this, that, you know, uh, to connect the Teeny Harris archive, the Ernst Withers archive, um, and you've instantly, you know, um, uh, maybe uh, mathematically doubled, you know, the uh, uh, archive's breadth, but probably in reality, geometrically uh, increased it. So um, uh, I think it, it, it's all about how we think about community uh, today. And, and perhaps the, 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 the big question about community and about Light Gallery was the, um, uh, how it was defined, you know, and 
today, it's uh, just from the presentations that you guys gave, it, it's uh, massively diverse, um, which is also, I think, very encouraging. You know, um. Yeah, one thing I was going to say is that um, out of those 70 students, um, Miss, I don't only say mistakenly because it's really hard to be an artist, but we do have students that come out of the teen photo program that uh, then want to be artists. And so, um, which is really fantastic, but we feel a very um, sincere obligation um, to help support them. And so we try to hire from our programs, from Women's Mobile Museum and Teen Photo as teaching artists and TAs within our program. And, but then the other thing is we try to make connections between all these different pockets, right? So because they don't have access to institutional communities, um, how can we act as a connector for them? Um, so thinking about that idea of um, youth education amongst these you know, institutions and us talking about that, I think that's a really great thing. I think it would also be a really great thing for the students that are coming out of this and wanting to become photographers to help build their community and make a larger circle because the only way to make it as an artist or living a creative life in that capacity is for you to have a community and a large community where you can access resources. Right, I know we have questions, but I, I actually have another question for you, Alec. It just occurred to me that, um, does any of this sound familiar to you in terms of um, um, your early beginnings as a photographer? You, you wrote to me about the Icebox exhibition, mm -hmm. for example, and, and how that came about. So um, is, is this something that, that you can relate to in terms of um, how your sense of community was built in, in photography? Yeah, I mean, for me, the, the, the number one most meaningful thing about the being here is that map. And thank you for that map. <laughs> because seeing these nodes and, and, and thinking about how things are connected. And so little tiny basement gallery in Minneapolis, teeny little node that leads to another one, that leads to another one. My only connection to Light Gallery, incidentally, was uh, Jim Henkel, photographer, right, right. taught at the University of Minnesota, and I took right. my first, uh, in the summer, a photo one class with him. Mm -hmm. There's a little tiny branch, yeah, right. and it, but once these things connect, and that's, and that's what you have to do, and, and, and that's what Anne is talking about, is then connecting nodes, and, and without that, yeah, you're utterly lost. Right, right. Um, Thank Hi, you. I'm Sama al I'm a professor here at the photo program at the School of Art, University of Arizona. Um, I am um, thinking back to a couple of the questions that Rick has asked or generated these conversations about uh, the internet, social media, and also um, uh, to you, Dominique, about the, the question of these archives and expanding that community through a community that you're directly engaging. And I'm thinking specifically of my time in, when I was in Palestine working with a new uh, Palestinian Museum and the project that they've engaged, which is called Family Album, um, and working within the Palestinian community to archive the vernacular, vernacular photographs. Um, so speaking about a marginalized community, that their photographs are um, at risk always of being uh, lost or destroyed or uh, neglected um, because of occupation and displacement. Um, and that seemed like a very specific agenda of that archiving um, that was happening, and it was also very peer-to-peer -peer as it was trans transpiring. But now that it's online, it sort of, I don't think they could have envisioned how important that archive is to so many people that thought that weren't a part of it, especially a lot of us who are in the diaspora, who are in different nations, who don't live there, who may have lost our entire archives and family archives from those displacements of multiple wars and over time. And it also speaks to the conversation of archives being a dynamic space and place where uh, different generations and different people can um, access them, but not just access them and celebrate them, but question them. And I think this is a conversation I'm always trying to have here at the CCP and at other archive spaces, because these canons and what gets collected often are not inclusive or not inclusive enough. And so when you do have the community, or whatever that community might be, whether it's students or researchers or young people or outside of it, and you allow that archive to be redefined um, expanded, reconsidered, questioned, a lot can be gained. So that's just really all my comment, and feel free to respond as you may like to. Well, I think that um, 
what, what touched me about your comment is the idea of the lost uh, uh, um, cultural importance of, of the photograph. Um, and I often wonder, uh, uh, because of the internet and because of uh, digital technology that you know, we're just um, wasting pictures away. You know, you can, we've, we've probably all made 20 pictures today without even thinking about it, um, at least. Uh, and uh, the, but the loss of, of the physical object of the photograph, um, in your cases, you're describing it through diaspora and through wars and uh, destruction, um, they still mean something. You know, the photograph still means something to people. And, uh, I, you know, this would take up another hour, I'm sure. But, um, you know, it would lead to the next question of, like, what is the, uh, you know, what is the future of photographic community? You know, how, how will photography build communities in the future? And uh, another thing that I'm sort of heartened by from uh, everything that you guys have said is that, I, I'm not going to worry about it so much, <laughs> you know, because you've all been so actively engaging with people that it, everything that you're, you're all doing has a life of its own, and it will continue that way, you know, it'll continue to uh, build upon itself and into the future. Um, so I'm, I'm actually quite heartened that, uh, that we we got all of this information out from, from each one of you. Um, we have time for, we have no more time. Um, <laughs> have, I just got the red light. We have no more time. Um, but I want to thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for attending this uh, amazing symposium. I want to thank Becky for inviting me and uh, for CCP for uh, hosting it. It's been really great. Thank you very much. You, you have 15 minutes to get more coffee, to use the bathroom. Please be back by 3.15.
day is made. You have to push on it. It takes a second for it to start. I think we're going to get ready if you'd like to come take a seat. Am I, am I on? Yes? Cool. I feel like I have my back to you. Okay. I'll just listen. Sorry. Okay. I will try and I will try and look at you from behind. I want to welcome you all back to our final panel for today. This is what I used to do in class. <laughs> I'm Meg Jackson Fox, Associate Curator of Academic and Public Programs here at the Center for Creative Photography. And across the way, I'm joined by my colleague, Emily Weirich, who is the Associate Archivist of Digital Initiatives here at the CCP. And I want to um, first echo Annie and Becky's thanks to our CCP colleagues. Emily and I are up here right now, but we are definitely sitting on the shoulders of giants. And I also want to extend a special welcome. One of the wonderful things about being at the University of Arizona and uh, now in the Arizona Arts is that we have a close relationship with our academic community. So I want to welcome our faculty, our staff, and our students who are here in the audience today. <laughs> and
And then lastly, I want to thank everyone who has, in the spirit of stories, um, been a part of storytelling for our exhibition, for the film that you'll see this evening, who have participated in the panel, and then also to all of you who are here now, who are now a part of this story, that we are simultaneously so grateful for your generosity, because sharing stories is generous, and exchanging in stories is very generous. Um, but it's also a privilege to get to have a microphone. <laughs> And to be, and for have your stories to be housed. So I want to remember that as well. So Emily and I will together moderate the second panel conversation on the tremendous value and the tremendous intricacies, intricacies of storytelling, on the liminal space of our narratives between experiences and imaginations, between our shared spaces and our individual logics, between our pasts and our presents and our futures, of course, and on the important work of capturing organizing, preserving, circulating, and exchanging oral story collections. And just before we offer a more extensive introduction of our guest panelists, Molly Garfinkel, Matthew Greeley, Cassie May, and Judy Natal, Emily and I thought to share just the briefest of highlights as to why the topic of oral storytelling has long been a source of interest for the CCP. Hi, so I'm Emily, and the legacy of oral histories here at CCP goes back to our founding in 1975. So I would like to have Harold Jones, our first director, give us a brief welcome to this panel from the past. Today is May 5th, 1977, and today we're going to do something a little bit different for those of you out there in the future. Welcome to all of you who are here in the audience with us today, to those of you who are uh, tuning in from afar via our stream, and of course to those of you who are out there in the future. Um, our collection of oral histories here at CCP now includes more than a thousand uh, unique oral histories that we have collected as a staff. They include tapings of symposia like this one, uh, of workshops, of, um, of lectures, and of course of interview style oral histories as well. And that legacy extends not only to the collection of those materials, but also uh, to teaching of uh, the next generation of oral historians and to archivists who learn how to collect these stories and to archive them for, again, the people in the future. <laughs> um, and. Uh, as well as the oral histories that we have created, we also have hundreds of additional oral histories that are interspersed throughout the archival collections here at CCP. And those are things that were made by photographers, educators, curators, when they interviewed their friends and colleagues, perhaps many of you who are in the audience at this point. And the heart of why all of this is so important to us at CCP lies in the research value of this material. By having oral histories, it allows us to experience uh, another side of photography, to learn about details of a process that we might not get from reading a book. Um, it allows us insight into things that we might not otherwise glean by doing other forms of research about a photographer or about an exhibition. And it also offers us an intimate chance to get to know a photographer in a way that we might not get to just by looking at their work. And through this, it allows us to better understand that work going into the future. So where our collection stands now is that uh, most of it still looks like this, and it's in an analog form. I like to encourage people to look at the different sizes of these boxes and take note of all of the different kinds of audiovisual materials that we have, um, because uh, as you likely know, when photographers do things, they like to experiment with all kinds of different technology. So many thanks to Harold and other people who have uh, created such a diverse collection of different kinds of media in our oral history collection. Um, it's actually quite fun to work with. Um, but what we're doing now is trying to figure out how to migrate it, how to digitize it, how to provide online uh, discovery and access potentially through uh, streaming services. And uh, we are, of course, uh, continuing our legacy of creating oral histories um, now by deliberately seeking out more diverse 
photographic histories in the oral histories that we collect here, and of course, in continually coming up with new and exciting things for those of you out there in the future. So with that, we are next going to introduce each one of our panelists. Meg and I are going to provide a brief biography of each panelist, and then they'll uh, have five minutes to talk about their work as it relates specifically to storytelling. So I would like to get started by introducing Molly Garfinkel. She is the managing director of City Lore, as well as the director of City Lore's Place Matters program. Both roles enable her to lead initiatives related to cultural resource management, public history, museum education, exhibition curation, and traditional arts presentation. Garfinkel's research explores Western and non-Western building traditions, theories of cultural landscapes, and histories of urbanism and city planning. She holds a BA in Art History from Wesleyan University and an MA in Architectural History from the University of Virginia. Please join me in welcoming Molly. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, how's this uh, in terms of sound and volume? It's good? OK, great. Um, I first wanted to um, thank CCP for including me in this really wonderful uh, symposium. It's really an honor to have uh, this up up close and personal access to so many incredible people um, and to be part of what really feels like a reunion, a very graceful um, and inclusive conversation. Um, and it's really nice to be able to be part of this in the thick of it. So thanks very much. Um, so I am here um, from New York City uh, from an organization called City Lore. And City Lore is a what we call a cultural conservation nonprofit. Uh, we're based in the Lower East Side, but we really work across all five boroughs um, and actually across the United States to document, present, and advocate for grassroots cultures and living traditions. And we've been doing this since 1986. Um, and City Lore uh, primarily works in four cultural domains. So I'll tell you a little bit more about My Place Matters program in just a moment. But we work um, in in-school and out-of-school time education, in grassroots poetry and endangered language traditions, and in oral history and urban folklore documentation. And in all of these domains, we try to abide by Don Adams and Arlene Goldbard's definition of cultural democracy, which says that cultural diversity is a positive social value to be protected and encouraged, that authentic democracy requires active participation in cultural life, not just passive consumption of cultural products, that many cultural traditions coexist and that none should be allowed to become an official culture, which is something we're talking a lot about in national and international news media these days, um, and that equity demands fair distribution of cultural resources and support throughout the society. So my program, uh, Place Matters, really relies in a lot of ways on the other three domains or departments of city lore who um, create deep uh, relationships with a lot of the communities who ultimately um, nominate places or come to me for advocacy through the Place Matters program. Um, as many of you know, uh, real estate is sort of a tension-inducing topic in New York. So working with communities on cultural traditions, on knowledge ways, on um, manifestations that are stewarded by um, place and create a sense of place is really one way of getting at the issue of real estate and um, who controls it. So Place Matters is a storytelling and ethnography-based community advocacy and preservation initiative. We work with places ranging from high-style icons like Philip Johnson's World's Fair Pavilion in Queens to what we call community anchors, the small businesses, social clubs, and religious institutions that incubate culture, help to keep communities vital and distinctive, and instill a sense of belonging, a critical public health issue. Um, and what we use story for is to better understand what scholars call a sense of place, or what we at City Lore call the poetry of everyday life. Um, as Barbara Johnston says, our sense of place is rooted in narration. Our person is at home in a place when the place evokes stories, and conversely, stories can serve to create places. And at Place Matters, I work with all kinds of places, places of poetry, of procession, of performance, of play, of politics, and everything in between. 
And one of the ways that we've used story over the past uh, 20 plus years is in what we call place marking projects. Um, and these projects seek to move beyond the sort of traditional brass plaque mode of calling out place significance. Our place markers put photographs, personal stories, and cherished memories directly into the landscape, often right where the stories took place. They make visible longtime residents who increasingly feel marginalized as their neighborhoods gentrify or change. The markers transform participants' stories of struggle and achievement into a legacy for all who pass by. We have also used storytelling as an advocacy and community organizing tool. Um, many of you know this uh, image by John Fechner, uh, Broken Promises from 1980. So this is what people have historically thought of when they think of the South Bronx, that the South Bronx burned. And I think there was a question earlier about um, what year it was that we sort of almost declared bankruptcy and the uh, Abe Beam administration was 1975. Um, and that's really the period um, of history that people think of often or historically thought of when um, the, the South Bronx was invoked. But it's so much more than burnt out buildings. Um, what we think about at Place Matters is that every site has many narratives that define it. There isn't one official culture or one official narrative that really singularly defines any place. And what we try to do is enable communities to take control of the narrative and use that as an asset to take control of the development of their places. Um, our South Bronx Latin Music Project used storytelling to help residents reappropriate the narrative of the South Bronx and take control of their neighborhood's redevelopment. We documented the histories of Latin music, the mambo and salsa era of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and the hip-hop era of the 80s, 90s, and really which goes on until today and has created a global movement. Um, we used these stories to transform the, neighbor the neighborhood's distinctive musical heritage into a resource that could be tapped for cultural and civic renewal. So sometimes people ask me, okay, great, so storytelling, it's great, we, we expand the narrative, what, what, what can it really do? What is this doing you know, in a, in a longer-term sense? And we often work with communities on what we call long-term engagement community-focused projects, and this is one of them that started very modestly with uh, storytelling sessions, what we called community conversations, held in correlation with a community development corporation in the South Bronx, where we had music and dance and, uh, and food and asked people to sort of extemporaneously stand up and tell their memories of dancing in some of these venues, of being in the record store when the first pressing came out of the new hit, of playing stickball on the street with the guys who would become the world-renowned musicians. Sort of in a way that's happening here this weekend, many of you have stood up and shared these kinds of stories and it's really enriching the history um, as we've discussed sort of earlier in this project. Um, and through these community conversations, um, we were able to conduct dozens and dozens of oral histories with people who don't typically get um, thought of as experts. So also at Place Matters and City Lore more generally, we tried to put into practice historian Michael Frisch's notion of shared authority, that we don't consider ourselves the absolute experts on any topic, that the communities who practice traditions, who bear knowledge, who have worldviews, are just as expert as we are. Um, some of the sort of more modest deliverables that came out of this project were the very first ever printed map of the musical heritage of the South Bronx and East Harlem, and a walking tour and bus tour of the South Bronx, which I know that's a, sort of hard now with the deuce and the get down, and as we've discussed over this weekend, sort of the credibility and the, the, um, the sheen that's on the 70s now, but in 2000 and 1998, uh, 1999 and the millennium when this project was taking place, that wasn't quite the case. So this was really landmark. Um, and what came out of all of these oral histories and the bus and walking tours and asking people to take ownership of their own history, to consider themselves experts, was that we discovered that the South Bronx musical heritage included what I think of as an ecology of places. And I'm so glad that so many people uh, this weekend have invoked and complimented the community map um, in the exhibit, which really beautifully illustrates the web of connections. Um, and that's what we think of um, in Place Matters too, is that it wasn't just the music venues and the clubs, it was the candy store, it was the funeral parlor, it was the stickball streets, it was the record shop, it was PS52, where many of the musicians were educated, that helped to create this constellation of places and individuals that keep this heritage strong and are used as an asset um, that keep communities in place because this community really very largely still is in place, even if a lot of these venues are not. 
One of the other things that came out of this project, which seems small or modest, but actually was not, was a reunion concert of many of these musicians who are truly some of the most famous musicians to um, influence world music as we know it, uh, in 2000 at the park, so another place typology across the street from the school where the students had recess. Um, that is now an important music venue. Um, and many of these musicians had retired back to Puerto Rico and flew themselves up on their own dime to participate. Um, and we were filming all of this and recording these oral histories as we went, which contributed to a feature length documentary called From Mambo to Hip Hop, which we created um, it, and produced with our uh, board president, who's a Henry Chalfant, who's also a photographer who some of you might know, uh, famous for his uh, photographs of uh, graffiti on trains, uh, who co-produced Subway Art in 1984 with our house photographer, Martha Cooper, um, who is now really enjoying um, renown in her 70s, being flown all over the world uh, for her really seminal, groundbreaking work capturing street art and street dance. Um, and it's been a real honor to work with her in tandem with her beautiful photographs, um, which are actually peppered throughout this um, presentation, to capture both the, the image and the story together. She's also a fellow Baltimorean, so I feel you know we have a connection in that way. Um, and so then what? So these stories um, have found a, a temporary home in a what we call the Bronx Music Heritage Center, which is a an education and performance space um, that we co-founded with an affordable housing organization in the Bronx um, that is soon to get a custom-designed permanent home called the Bronx Music Hall in the Melrose uh, redevelopment area, um, which will be an education center, a several hundred seat auditorium, an exhibition space, and an archive for a lot of the stories and memories that were collected over 20 years through this project. And it's also meant to have housing that is dedicated. Um, something we really think a lot about is aging in place, keeping people, uh, senior citizens in place, people who really whose legacies help to create the neighborhood um, and the identity that people want to move into. So to be able to uh, afford, keep affordable housing for them um, in this affordable housing development is really, I think, the apotheosis of a project like this. It's, th it's on their backs that this uh, history and this legacy and the redevelopment of the South Bronx was built. Um, out of this project also came a nomination. So I, I'm, a, I'm an historian, an architectural historian, and I work a lot with more traditional preservation channels, um, including the National Register of Historic Places, which is sort of the official list of places and cultural landscapes and objects that help to tell the history of the United States. So Casa Amadeo is one of these places in the giant ecology of the South Bronx musical heritage. It is the longest running Latin music store in the Bronx uh, in New York. Um, and we were able to nominate it to the National Register in 2001 um, as a result of this, proce uh, this project. Um, the entire building um, is actually designated, but the entire nomination is really about Casa Amadeo and Mike Amadeo and his sister who founded it and continued to run it. And amazingly, 2001, this is the very first Puerto Rican site on the mainland to be designated on the National Register of Historic Places. That is unbelievable. So. Moving forward, pushing um, the boundaries of many things is something I really enjoy doing. Um, and so I am now um, using story to really, really challenge a lot of the um, policies, the traditional policies of our national um, preservation program, the National Register, um, working with casitas. So all of these photographs are by Martha Cooper. Um, from the 1980s, she did a, an incredible survey of over 100 casitas, which are traditional bungalows built by Puerto Rican communities on community gardens across New York. They are social clubs, they are cultural centers, they are sanctuaries. They are many things. They are re-territorializations of these burnt out lots from the 1970s and 80s when the city divested from the Lower East Side, East Harlem, and the South Bronx. These communities, with sweat equity, um, cleared them out and built beautiful gardens and homes away from home um, and cultural centers there. And they're a fragile typology because as many of you know, Giuliani um, went to war with the community gardens in New York um, and auctioned many of them off. Um, and as a result, um, the uh, city's sort of community garden program has looked less favorably on these what are otherwise sort of illegal DIY structures. But they are a critical typology, an under-documented typology. Um, and because there are no building permits associated with them or other written sources, it is entirely photography and story-based that my argument to the National Register for why these should be uh, designated is going to be based. And we are specifically interested in Rincon Criollo, 
um, which is sort of the Ur Casita, um, that is a world premier center of bomba and plena, which are traditional Puerto Rican music and dance forms. People come from all over the world to learn to make instruments, to learn to dance, and to learn to uh, sing from the folks at Rincon Criollo. Um, but they break absolutely every rule of the National Register. They are not high style. They have been moved. They have been rebuilt with different materials. They are definitely less than 50 years old. But we're using a specific criteria called traditional cultural property, which suggests a living site. It is a, tr it is a site that has no end date of significance, but whose significance whose significance goes on and is critical to a culture sense of itself. This was typically used for Native American sites, um, but we are invoking it here in this urban context because we think it is appropriate um, and because we think that these underrepresented communities really need to get uh, their fair share on the National Register and with a preservation policy, or perhaps preservation policy should change to meet the realities on the ground. So. Um, What's, I'll leave you with this final note. So these are some typical casitas. I'm actually writing the typology as we speak because it hasn't ever been studied before. Um, and I'm sorry I took out this last slide um, that I'm not gonna show you in a moment, but what's great about these projects too is that we're not trying to um, be tokenizing. We're not trying to be deterministic and tell people what their value is, what their culture is um, important for, what they are meant to represent. So an example in this project on November 7th, 2016, a date that should live in infamy and of all our minds is the date before the election. Um, I was in East Harlem uh, conducting my very first oral history uh, interview for this project and spoke to a gentleman who had founded a casita in his native East Harlem because uh, after, you know, sort of in the mid 80s or early 80s, um, the uh, police started coming around and harassing him uh, for playing dominoes on the sidewalk, and that really picked up um, a few years later. So he had this empty lot across the street from where he used to play and build this casita. And we're talking and we're talking, and he mentions you know, that he was a nurse and uh, was, is now a teaching artist. And I noticed that on the front of the casita, it says Central Park Five exonerated in sort of banner letters like uh, you have for birthdays or other celebrations. I said, Raymond Santana, what is this? And he said, well, my son was one of the Central Park Five, and I started being harassed after Donald Trump, who was elected the very next day, placed an ad in the paper calling for the death penalty uh, for these five young boys. And so as a result of that, I created this social club cultural center, sanctuary space for myself, my son, uh, and my community, because that's really what this represents for me. It's my Puerto Rican heritage, but it's also my right to be here as a New Yorker. And this was not an intended outcome of this project, of course. It's not what the National Register is looking for, but it really speaks to um, the intersectionality and the importance of deep listening, of broad communication, and storytelling, um, and open-mindedness uh, in the work that we do. So I'd leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Molly. And next I'd like to introduce Dr. Matthew Greeley, is an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Arizona, where he directs the Human Memory Laboratory. Greeley's research interests are broadly focused on uncovering how and why the brain stores and retrieves memories, understanding the impact of aging and brain injury on real world learning and memory, and identifying effective interventions for the adaptive use of learning and memory in our everyday lives. He is the principal investigator on research awards from the National Institute on Aging, the Arizona Alzheimer's Consortium, and the Evelyn F. McNaught Brain Foundation. He also collaborates on research funded by the National Science Foundation and has published over 20 scientific research articles on the neuropsychology and cognitive neuroscience of memory. Welcome, Dr. Greeley. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this event. Um, I, I, what I'd like to do with uh, my five minutes is uh, talk a bit about some of the connections that since Meg asked me to uh, be involved, uh, I've come to realize uh, are, are shared between uh, what I study in the laboratory uh, and as a clinician, what uh, people come to my office and share. Uh, and, uh, and what you capture uh, through uh, your art. Uh, and in the spirit of the theme, uh, 
of uh, our, our group here, I thought I'd start by sharing a story that I think captures some of the important uh, connections that I've uh, come to realize between what we do. Uh, so this is, and of course I have to show a photograph. Uh, so this is, a, is one that my wife uh, captured um, shortly after we moved here to Tucson about four and a half years ago. Uh, and uh, this was a, a, a time of, of change. Uh, we ha were in Boston beforehand uh, and uh, we were trying to get comfortable in our new city and we thought we should try to do something that feels familiar and we really enjoyed taking our son to the Boston City Zoo and we thought well let's see what Tucson has to offer uh, and I'll admit that on the way to the zoo I was uh, skeptical that I was gonna like it um, and it turns out that uh, Tucson has a fantastic zoo and one of the things that uh, we had the opportunity to do, as you can see here, uh, that was unexpected, uh, was uh, feed a giraffe. Uh, and uh, my son, who was not quite one, um, understood, as is typical for cognitive development at his age, he understood more language than he could share. Um, but we got the impression that he understood what we were gonna do. And initially he said, he, uh, through his behavior, said he wanted to feed the giraffe. Um, you can see he changed his mind at the last second, um, and I fed the giraffe. Um, now this was, uh, I, I'm very thankful that my wife uh, captured this photograph because again, I was skeptical that I was gonna like it. Uh, and this, uh, I think, really uh, captured our emotions and our shared emotions about uh, our move and, and what we realized Tucson was gonna be. Um, now this would have been enough on its own, uh, but uh, just a little bit to add to it, for dinner that night we happened to be having peas and carrots as our vegetable. Uh, and I'm sitting next to my son and you can see the wheel spinning in his mind. And he picks up his carrot and he reaches out to feed it to me. Uh, and for, for someone who studies learning and memory, that's uh, just a, a fascinating uh, case study. Uh, I said, oh, he thinks other people eat carrots. And my wife said, no, he thinks you look like a giraffe. <laughs> Uh, and as I've spent the last six months, uh, since Meg asked me to be a part of this, reflecting on the connections between what I do in the lab and, and what you all do, um, I realized that uh, a moment like this um, really hits on three important themes. Uh, one uh, is that uh, our memories, uh, of, of, like our photographs, capture snapshots in time. Uh, snapshots that when we relive them internally, uh, we we can sort of mentally go back in time uh, and uh, seemingly uh, relive it. When we share them with other people, um, we get to take other people with us. Uh, memories also provide a lot of context. Uh, so I didn't just describe feeding the giraffe, I told you what led up to us being there and why it mattered and what happened next. And uh, I feel like what you do does the same. Uh, and uh, finally, it says a lot about who we are. Uh, so uh, by sharing a story over a few minutes, maybe you feel like you know a little bit about who I am. Uh, and clearly it was uh, something I chose to tell you uh, so you got a glimpse of where I come from. Uh, and, uh, and especially hearing some of the talks uh, so far today, I, I again feel like that's what you do. So I'm not the, of course, first person to, to, to realize this. Using art in a different medium, uh, Norman Rockwell uh, nicely captures everything that I just uh, talked about. Uh, so in his uh, uh, sort of self-portrait, uh, you can see that uh, Norman Rockwell chooses to uh, capture not just what he looks like today, a snapshot in time, but also what he used to look like uh, in, a, in a very sort of uh, playful way. Uh, he also uh, scatters around the scene uh, objects that represent uh, important periods of time in his life. And so uh, he includes objects that uh, represent places that he had lived and visited that uh, were influential for his career. Uh, and he uh, also uh, essentially communicates that when he uh, thinks about what his self-portrait will be, he turns to his past and thinks about where he's been and, and how he got to where he is now. 
Uh, you can similarly see uh, some of these same themes uh, in uh, the work of William uh, Uttermolen. So uh, these are not uh, uh, three self-portraits drawn by different people, but actually three all drawn by, Utter, uh, by Uttermolen. Uh, and what is interesting about uh, uh, William Uttermolen is he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in, seemed to have lost, oh, in, uh, in uh, t I believe it was 1996. On the far left, we have his self-portrait in 1967, when he was really getting going with his art. Uh, the one in the middle is one that he uh, uh, made when, in 1995, shortly before his diagnosis. And the one on the far right is from 2007, shortly before he passed. Uh, and in my lab, uh, these are some of the things that we try to get a glimpse into as well by studying uh, what uh, uh, disruption to memory uh, does in terms of our ability to travel back in time mentally, uh, to share the stories of our lives and to understand ourselves. Uh, and uh, William Uttermullen captured this, this uh, what we find in the lab very well, in the sense that uh, the self remains, but it becomes more abstract, it becomes less vivid. So again, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak uh, and to share some of the themes that I've noticed between what we study in the lab and what you all do. Thank you, Matthew. Next up, we have Cassie May. As the Jerome Robbins Dance Division's oral history archivist, Cassie May cares for the stories of lives in dance while, pay, while paying special attention to record absent voices from the archive. At the New York Public Library since 2009, she formerly, formerly cataloged the Merce Cunningham audio collection and was the oral history assistant. A lifelong dancer, Cassie has performed and collaborated with New York-based dancers or dance artists D Dean Moss, Melissa Fenley, Julianne Pena, and Jesse Phillips Fine, among others. She holds an MSLIS, oh, sorry, MSILS, sorry, mine's different, um, from a Pratt Institute and a BA in dance from Mills College. Please join me in welcoming Cassie. Before I talk to you about dance oral histories at the New York Public Library, I would like to take an, a moment to acknowledge um, that we are all guests here on the original homelands of the Tohono O'odham and Pascua Yaqui peoples who are stewards of this land, past, present, and future. Thank you for this place that we gather today. Um, I'd also like to thank Meg and the CCP for inviting me to contribute to this historic conversation about light and photography. Sorry, I realized I was going to be leaning over the whole time. Um, photography and dance have a very special relationship, um, as photography was one of the first ways that dance was documented for the historic record. And I couldn't resist including documentation from my own dancing career. Um, this was when I was in rehearsal with Melissa Fenley in a much younger version of me in 2005 in a photograph by Julie Lemberger, a uh, very renowned dance photographer. Um, during my dancing career, a few questions persisted as the years advanced. What are the traces that a dancer performing artist leave behind? And how will the future encounter these traces? While studying for my master's in library science, I became an assistant in the Dance Oral History Project of the New York Public Library's Jerome Robbins Dance Division. There, I listened to many hours of the project's 460 long-form interviews, and I learned the practice of oral history by recording, helping in the ongoing recording of dancers, choreographers, producers, dance scholars, and collaborative artists such as um, lighting designers, costume designers, and photographers. Like so many of our researchers, I too experienced the particular power of the human voice and of story. 
I've been deeply moved, stirred, and inspired to hear the voices of dance legends and my ancestors and experience a connection with them, moving back through time inside of their vivid stories. I wish I could let the stories speak for themselves today, but since we don't have a lot of time, maybe at some point I'll be able to play a clip during this talk. But these two artists are both, Tina Ramirez on the left is the founder of Ballet Hispanico, and Keith Lee on the right it was the first African-American soloist for the American Ballet Theater. Both are represented in the Oral History Projects collection. Um, the project began at a time when serious scholarship on dance and the study of it as an art form was expanding. In 1974, very prominent year that keeps coming up in this weekend, um, there were relatively few biographies or texts on dance available to study, much less archival collections. The dance division itself was only 30 years old when it started the project in order to document the stories of important figures within the field and actively contribute to the growth of its own collection, rather than wait passively for materials from donors. This was particularly visionary to pair a verbal documentation strategy of oral history with a form that commonly expresses itself through nonverbal means. Ongoing through today, the, the project provides a service to the dance field as a storytelling site within the largest archive devoted to dance in the world. By ensuring that the lives, relationships, and creative processes of dancers are documented through their own voices, these testimonies inspire a more nuanced, complex, and personal understanding of dance history. Storytelling has always been a crucial tool of transmission for an artist, and even more, more so for a dancer. Dancers learn their art directly from one body to another, passed across generations. Similar to dance's transmission, the form and practice of oral history as formalized storytelling is a highly complementary fit for documenting the memories of the dance community. As one of the project's recent interviewees, Sandra Rivera, a ballet Hispanico dancer, wrote to me, quote, as a result of the experience of doing the oral history, I committed to seeing some significant individuals to me that I had meant to visit and express my most sincere gratitude. I visited Mariano Parra, and he was so happy to have my company. We looked at some videos, and I could directly tell him of his contributions to my artistic life, as well as the Spanish dance community. A very special moment, end quote. This is a powerful example of how the project inspires new connections of movement history and community relationships across generations. However, not all voices and communities in dance have been equally represented throughout the project. In recording an average of only 15 stories a year, I consider the inherent number of dance stories that we lose to memory, I'm sorry, to memory loss and death, as well as through institutional omissions and biases. There are a number of dancers who have contributed to the field artistically and personally in ways that aren't yet officially included in the historic narrative of dance. Within the project's current arc selection process, I consciously seek to address gaps in perspective and diversify the archive. One effective practice I've been instituting is to invite self-representation in the archive is by working with project narrators to select their own interviewers. Last month, we recorded with Diane Harvey, who's on the top photograph to the right. Um, we recorded with Diane Harvey, who selected Stephanie Berry, a, both a dance and acting colleague and um, a longtime friend of hers. Um, I, Diane, I invited her to tell her part of the Forces of Nature Dance Company story after I found an oral history taken for our collection in 1998 with her husband, Abdel Salam, the Forces of Nature Company's co-founder and her husband. Um, another example of expanding the archive is when I invited June Ekman, who's in the center. Uh, she's a lesser known dancer in the original Judson Dance Theater Collective from the early 1960s. At the time I invited her, she was convinced that her story doesn't matter and suggested that I interview someone more important. Her response shifted when we arranged for the interviewer to be Shelley Center, her longtime student and protege. 
My last example of, is an interview with Marianne Soto, who is a Puerto Rican American artist who innovated a synthesis of postmodern improvisational methods with salsa and social dancing. This uh, interview was in, actually initiated by Ram Ramon Rivera Cervera, a performance studies scholar who suggested to me the need to increase Latinx perspectives in the project and the dance division's collections. As my work continues, my biggest goal moving forward is to spread the word about the project and amplify the stories within it through public programs, exhibits, and online projects, which is a unique challenge in that most of the collection was recorded before the internet existed. Um, so I look forward to the panel's conversation today, especially around strategies to share and disseminate the stories that are so fundamental to the past, present, and future of our art forms. Thank you, Cassie. And then lastly, we have Judy Natal. She's an interdisciplinary photographic artist, educator, curator, and writer. An archive of her environmentally focused work was established at the Center for Art and Environment at Nevada Museum of Art in 2012. And her photographs and videos have been exhibited nationally and internationally, including the Sao Paulo Biennale, Brazil, and Houston Photo Fest 2016. Her work is included in the permanent collections of the California Museum of Photography, the Center for Creative Photography, the George Eastman Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Photography, and the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, among others. She has received commissions from the Center for Energy and Environmental Research in the Human Sciences at Ross University, Burlington City Arts, and Hyde Park Art Center Chicago, awards and fellowships including a Fulbright Travel Grant, Polaroid Grants, New York and Illinois Photography Fellowships, and numerous artist residencies in Iceland, the Faroe Islands, Biosphere 2, and the Robotics Institute. Join me in welcoming Judy. Thank you. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here. What a privilege and an honor. There's so many people here who are professional acquaintances, old friends. I'm grateful to see you all. And many thanks to Rebecca and her great team for putting together this fantastic symposium. It's an honor, as I say, and a privilege. Okay. I've been asked uh, for this panel to share my tools and strategies based upon my experiences around story. The single most important tool is a sustained curiosity and awareness of not knowing but wanting to find out. This is a lifelong habit. My work engages with the pathways or connective tissues between things, stories, emotions, and highlights the interconnectivity of experience built upon collaboration to create hybrid works that both listen and speak. Though narrative and story are words that I try really hard not to use, They've become catch-all phrases, especially for photographers, though there are, of course, exceptions to the rule, and there are some of those in this room. Uh, writers are much more careful, and their understanding much more expansive in their use. I ask the viewer to interact with landscapes, portraits, still life, video interviews as a text to focus on each word, phrase, and paragraph at a time. My ult ultimate intent is to invert the traditional text-image relationship by reading the photograph and viewing the text as image, rendering ambiguous the lines between culture and nature, art and language, and photography and prose. For every project, I create a library of art, artifacts, and research materials to invite people into the conversations that the work uh, engages with, and this library is a vital part of my exhibition, all my exhibitions, along with photographs, video, and sometimes sculpture. Quote, what narrative has to do is move. It has to end up in a different place than where it started. That is what narrative does. It goes, it moves. Story is change. That's Ursula K. Le Guin. I am compelled to seek out and share stories of individuals to amplify sustainable practices and relevant voices who share an acute relationship to the natural world. This project involves long-form video interviews, archival research, 
visual and writ written journaling, and collecting research materials to become the library, creating an immersive experience to be both exhibited and published. So, The Weather Diaries started in 2016 and is ongoing. And I'm going to let you read that. I apologize for the length of it, but I'd rather you read it than I speak it. <laughs> so, uh, questions and curiosity drives my work forward. Archival materials are vital tools to understand historic contexts, and they are way more than that. They inspire. I discovered this photograph in Torshan, Faroe Islands, and the anonymous image has haunted my dreams ever since. Ultimately, I was able to find out more about the photographer and his subject. Subsequently, the walking knitter has become one of the many narrative threads of the weather diaries weaving the past, present, and future together. I marvel that every interview and oral history has to be first driven by curiosity, then questions, then access. Here you see a very fragile volume from 1934-35 from an archive of a single Icelandic man's lifelong weather diary. Essentially, I feel I must become an expert in all the directions and disciplines the work engages with through deep research, chiseling out a starting point of who to meet and who to interview, then figure out how to gain access. And that's hard enough, figuring out access. It is not unusual that after long interviews, I become overwhelmed by the generosity and intensity of the experience. Not only do I create a piece of the project, but I feel I am molecularly altered by the experience. I move away from the neutral distance often created with photographic space to engage all five senses, sometimes a sixth sense, personal experiences, embracing emotional responses as, as equal to intellectual ones, to share questions that I share with my subject. Questions are the heartbeat of my work. Questions have a certain insistence that forces us to listen, to step out of our comfort zones, asking questions, encouraging oral histories to be told from generation to generation. Asking questions presumes that we don't have all the answers. Opening up our perspectives to consider other points of view and diverse knowledge forms. As we grapple with environmental insecurities and risks, issues of environmental justice, and try to create more sustainable futures. Art has an unknowable, infinite way to move people and to reconfigure abstract scientific data. The goal of my work is to share transformative ideas across disciplines that illuminates workable pathways rethinking and realigning our relationship to our planet. Nature, like us, is not a fixed entity. I'll let you read, uh, oh. let you read this quote by Ai Weiwei as I tell you a little anecdote uh, from last night. So last night at the reception, um, I was asked what my relationship was to Light Gallery. And I thought about it a minute, and I said, none. And, um, and then I thought about it some more, and I realized that um, Light Gallery, that, that Light Gallery has uh, inspired me all of my life. It has impacted my education. It has impacted my artistic practice, which I've sustained for approximately 40 years. It has impacted the way the world understands and sees photography. So I am grateful to Light Gallery. Thank you very much. So I want to mention a couple of things first. And one is that 
I really see community and storytelling as something porous. Like they really have so much connectivity there. And the second is that this is a resolutely interdisciplinary conversation. Um, and this is something that the center is really committed to and um, because we believe that there is magic at our intersections and that photography, I believe, photography uniquely, fa uniquely facilitates those kinds of intersections. And so what we're going to do is pose just a few grand questions and then we'll open it up to all of you to either respond to those grand questions or, e or even pose your own. So first I'd like to unfold the title of the panel Valuing Story. Telling stories about ourselves with one another is a deeply complex industry. Stories are filled with memories and imagination and experiences, hopes and fears, and the list could go on. And they're substantive or sometimes superficial. They're bendable and flexible and stories change with time, with interpretation. So I wanted just to start with Molly, if you would let me. It's always nice to say that, yes, Molly. Uh, so Molly, what does it mean to consider or to engage storytelling or stories? And then I'm, we'll open it up to everyone else. What does it mean to consider or engage storytelling? Mm -hmm. Stories. Um, as you say, um, you know, City Lore is a folklore-based um, organization. So we we do think about the way that actually stories change over time, um, but we engage. I mean, everything that we do is. Um, sort of story-based, uh, because we really believe that, uh, as I said earlier, that um, shared expertise is really the way of uh, getting at w something that is closer to the truth and approaching a more perfect union, as people say. Um, and everyone has stories, so that is at least something that um, is a great equalizer. Even though people don't consider themselves experts, they have their own impressions, their own experiences, um, and story actually, I think, lends a lot of agency so one of the things we think about at City Lore also quite a lot is um, young people and their sense of agency and their um, sensibility around storytelling and their own narrative. So our education programs really ask um, even very small uh, students to um, take ownership of their own, their own thoughts, their own experiences, um, their own daily practices, um, and think of themselves as citizen advocates and use story um, to, to take, yeah, to take ownership and to have agency and to consider themselves important and their perspectives important. Story, is that better? Yeah. Uh, story is a, a way for me to kind of, uh, it invites me to step out of my own artistic practice and allow other people to step forward. So I, uh, I'm clearly aware, this has altered the way I make pictures. Uh, I might, they may not be as aesthetically dynamic or formal, uh, but I am, really trying to make room for a, another person or persons to step forward and uh, allow um, them to tell their own stories. And I think we might often forget, maybe not, that our aesthetic and formal choices are, are profound tools of interpretation. And uh, so it's very important for me and I've, it's been a learning process to step away from what kind of undo the learning that I've had to allow um, other people's uh, ideas of how they want to present themselves to come forward. Um, for me, I, when I think about approaching story as a facilitator, I think about uh, how to create the space where stories can arise and how to uh, develop parameters that allow for someone to uh, come in and be able to express themselves um, in a non-judgmental, open uh, arena. Um, and often that is uh, influenced by 
an interviewer and like whose perspective is coming into the room. And so um, when I train interviewers, uh, I ha ask them to think about listening, in particular deep listening and, and really uh, opening up expectations around what could arise within an interview context. Uh, and I can add a little bit about what we've learned from studying why people share memories. And I'll leave it to you to uh, judge how well it seems to apply to what um, we do with uh, photography. But um, uh, by asking people uh, the types of memories that they share in their everyday lives, as well as by observing them, uh, we've learned that people uh, have a variety of motives um, for telling others things. Uh, this includes to teach and inform, uh, to try and make decision making, uh, deci to try and make decisions, to try and problem solve, um, to uh, contemplate what could have been instead of what was, uh, to reflect on what might become. Uh, and uh, we've also learned from studying why people share memories uh, that uh, the motives that we tend to gravitate towards do change as we age. Uh, so uh, younger adults oftentimes are trying to problem solve and, and make decisions. Um, and uh, we find that uh, in, in older age, uh, people tend to shift towards uh, sharing memories to teach and inform uh, and to contemplate what might become. I have a follow-up question for, for Cassie to start, and maybe some of you want to contribute as well. You've talked a lot about um, expanding the, the archive that you're working with by um, having different people interview the people who you select to be interviewed. Um, and so how, you mentioned the, the next phase of this in terms of the access and, and discovery. So do you think about, or what do you think about how to a address that issue, that same issue when it comes to access, um, particularly as so many of our oral histories are going in a digital direction, um, and yet we're all working with a, a country in particular and a world that has a, a deep digital divide. <laughs> Maybe you don't have an answer. That's okay. What are your, th but what are your thoughts about that? I love that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think the challenge actually in, in disseminating or, or opening up the archive in the form of oral history is that they are long form, uh, they're recorded in long form time-based mediums that um, aren't always conducive to a sound bite. <laughs> and so it's a different kind of interview structure than, than an interview that's, um, being recorded for an, an exhibit or for uh, a podcast, um, and and so so my challenge has that I've been thinking about a lot is um, yeah how to pare down and and, and amplify the parts uh, that could really be uh, that people could connect to, um, and then the other side of that is if the interviews themselves were conducted at a time when there wasn't an internet, there wasn't social media, there wasn't, uh, the narrator had no idea that these forms could be a place where the interview could live. Um, I have to, you know, ethically seek permissions and make sure that everything is in place in terms of what the narrator imagined could happen to their interview in the future um, and whether that's been uh, specifically discussed uh, in advance of the interview. I don't, I mean, it's, it's a very challenging time for that in, in, in an oral history project that's been ongoing for 46 years. I think other oral history projects that are now being recorded sort of have that in mind already in the outset of uh, the production. But it, for me in a library setting, Agreed. I, I mean, one thing that I have been working with is, you know, the library's legal team on opening up the release forms and making the language broad. And then when I talk to narrators, I talk to them about the possible ways that we, we may want to um, make these interviews more 
uh, accessible online and in exhibits and in public programming. Um, and one exciting thing that I have been doing is as listening parties, which is inviting the uh, par interview participants and then in the future the public, because all of the um, events at the library are free and open to the public. Um, so that's one way of like inviting the community in and making the interviews more accessible at this point to freely to you know address the digital divide and I think that answered some of you that but not <laughs> that's great um, so a minute no good okay um, sort of uh, almost on the opposite end of that um, City Lore uh, works as a part of a sort of a statewide um, affiliation and organization of other folklore agencies and other traditional practitioners and knowledge bearers um, and culture bearers. And we're really faced with the issue of what to do with the material um, when there isn't a central repository, when there are a million different um, media formats, and when the best sort of going for, uh, uh, forum is YouTube or Vimeo, really YouTube, um, where you know the algorithm could have like a Tajik lullaby next to a home video, next to a video game. I mean, just who knows wh what it's gonna read and what the metadata says, if it's accurate, if it's uh, easily stolen. So a colleague of mine um, who's the, uh, named Chris Muley, who is the uh, director of folk arts at the Brooklyn Arts Council has been working for several years on a website, it's a portal, uh, called the Niska Living Traditions Portal. And it is a place where um, communities and uh, folk arts organizations uh, by invitation and uh, they can request access or uh, an invitation can upload the materials in a sort of relational database. Um, and it makes a conversation uh, between a number of different cultural traditions across a very large, very diverse state. Um, and also allows levels of access, um, meaning that in some cases actually less access um, is the appropriate protocol. Um, so this is built with uh, something called Mukertu, um, which um, was designed with indigenous communities uh, both in mind and with them. Um, so for example, um, there may be a tradition that is only um, acceptable for women to participate in and, vi and view. So uh, communities can restrict access so that only women in their communities or communities who are aware of this can see it. Or um, something that is seasonal and should only be um, accessed at a certain time of year. Um, and so that's something that we're actually thinking about a lot also now because so many things already exist, where can we responsibly put them, at least for the time being, while we figure out that, that big question of the infinite cloud in the sky where we can all have free digitization <laughs> and accessibility, so, in perpetuity. That's great. Um, on one of the, I'm kind of going in the opposite direction, and I realize, you know, I'm not working for an institution, so it's, it's uh, quite a bit different, but uh, I am learning how to, uh, provide less control. And I give all of my interviews to my subjects. So when I record something, I uh, make a copy of it, I give it to them, I give them permission to use it in whatever way they see fit, and I give <coughs> photographs back. I, because I, I didn't mention in my talk, I do long form interviews and oral histories and then I do usually a separate session where I uh, make a still photograph. So for every portrait that you see uh, in the slide presentation, there was also an interview or an oral and or an oral history. And so I make prints for them, I either bring them back or I ship it to them. And I, I think one thing that's really important to remember is Often I'm talking to people whose uh, English is not their first language, and they're really embarrassed uh, because they do not have the sophistication of language that uh, they would have in their native in their native tongue, and so um, and I have to assure them that their English is good enough, and um, and that if there's any question, I would be back in contact with them and ask them to clarify 
their intentions or if they feel s strongly about it, I, I give, say that I will send you, I will transcribe the interview, send it to you, and um, provide some kind of translation and then you can um, uh, use it as you see fit and you can sign off on it. So this relinquishing of control and access is a kind of goes against my grain as a, as a photographer and an artist, but uh, that's what I have found to be necessary. This idea of giving back, I think is, uh, uh, we are taking whether we like to think it or not. And so the idea of uh, providing an exchange, an equal exchange is really important. So I'd like to open it up if you have any questions or comments or thoughts. Um, thanks, all of you, so much. That was a wonderful panel. Um, uh, Molly, I had a question directly for you. Right at the start, um, you mentioned briefly uh, about a sense of belonging as a public health issue, and I was wondering if you could please talk some more about that. Sure. In, in brief, and I would uh, not, cons not consider myself an expert in this topic, but... Cool. Um, <laughs> Alika Wally has done a lot of um, important thinking and writing about this, so I would point you to her writing. Um, sense of belonging, um, a sense of connectedness, a sense uh, that there's a fabric that will catch you if you're falling, um, a sense that there is a system in place that will take care of you um, that, is, that has your back. Um, there are so many issues that we are facing in this country that suggest that that is not true for so many people. Um, I'm not going to list them here, but... Um, it's really an important um, public health issue where people just feel like they are, the sy there, there isn't a system for them, and in fact that systems are against them. And in a lot of cases, they're right. Um, and so that is something that um, all people, it's a really interdisciplinary um, field of study that's taking a lot of prominence right now, um, and that happily funders seem interested in supporting at this moment. Um, but it's a really interesting topic that I think really, that speaks to a lot of the work that everyone in this weekend has um, touched on and is participating in. So yeah, check out Alika Wali, W-A-L-I. Thank you so much. Well, and um, telling story and, and marking your life and your career in a formal way is also, I think, public health. I mean, there is something about just like taking up the space of existing. And that is an exchange that I think about um, how the institution can give back and you know, to that sense of like being honored and being recognized for the, the work and life that someone has done. And so generosity does play a huge part in my work, just thinking about how generous it is for the narrators to give to us but then how do I give back with you, um, leveraging the institutional means that I have? And, and we also give back uh, the files from the interview, transcripts, um, and we also pay our interviewers, and I mean our interviewees in honorarium, and that's sort of an unusual practice, but I feel that their time um, and effort and their life story is value, and so, so we do, pay them an honorarium. So I think we have time just for one more quick question. Yeah, um, uh, what I'm about to say is not for you professionals, but I did two extensive interview projects. The first one when I was particularly young and stupid, and I didn't even get releases from anybody. Um, now they're very valuable, and all kinds of people want to uh, use the information, and I'm, I just I haven't coped with that yet, but I will have to. The other one was a, a much more sophisticated project, but there was a tiny phrase we didn't put in the contracts. We did get releases, and that little phrase was in all media for perpetuity. And by the time we wanted to make digital, the people we interviewed were gone, and the family said, no, 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 this is a new request. We want new money. And so I'm just throwing that out to others who want to take on projects like this. 
you should talk to people like this first <laughs> um, when you're trying to do, especially the big projects, um, because it just, you know, you think that families will be generous, but um, that has not been my experience. And on, oh, yeah. No, yes, yeah. R I think Rick Wetzer wants to say something here very, very, very quickly. <laughs> and then we have to wrap it up very, very quickly. Okay, I have 30 seconds. Um, um, I have a question for Matthew. Um, thank you. Um, has there been any research done in terms of memory being uh, culturally based so that um, the way uh, someone in one culture would remember something versus the way we might remember something? And what, what does it indicate? So there are strong cultural influences on the way we remember and share stories. Uh, and I thought this, I was actually thinking about this when we were talking about how in some cultures there may not be as much access to uh, the ability to store uh, uh, our life experiences um, and, and keep them in repositories. And, uh, and so some of the cultural differences that we see reflect uh, the importance that we place on uh, retaining memories from a personal perspective. Uh, so it, for, for some, it's more relevant what it means for the collective uh, than it does for the self. Uh, and in cultures where there's less dependence on uh, storing history in, uh, in, in photos or in other ways that you can sort of externalize life history, uh, there's less emphasis placed on accuracy. Um, as it's been put to me, it's more important what it means than what actually happened. Great. Well, thank you all so much for participating in this panel. Um, I feel like we could have a, another several hours of conversation here. Um, but before that can happen, um, we all have a program to go through today. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining us for our afternoon conversation. <laughs> And uh, we'd like to ask that now everyone please exit the auditorium so that we can prepare for the film screening coming up next. <laughs>